of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. See, we've got Rebecca Lindin on the Linden on the line with us. So, um, correct. And I, is Amy Waller going to be joining us? It is not her. Okay. And Ursula, do we know about Ursula? Okay. Uh, trustees, have you all had an opportunity to review the minutes? Okay. Jack, I know there was one change. Yeah. Um, in the Minutes of September 8th. Uh, I'll just read the minutes. There's a, a missing part. Vice Chair Fallon made a statement addressing the accusation that he threatened to take the attendee who was not wearing a mask to court because he was not wearing a mask. Fallon stated he did not make that threat. He only stated that's blank. So um, I don't remember the exact words that I used at that time, but it was something to the effect of uh, uh, the courts are always a legal um, uh, recourse to someone that's not happy with any kind of action a legislative body takes or an individual takes. So I just like the minutes to reflect that in some, some way, or we can wait and approve them at the next meeting, whichever the board wants to do, but I'm fine with all the other minutes. That was the only one that I uh, noticed something in. Well, I did notice in one of the minutes uh, there was a reference made to comments that had been electronically submitted. Okay. And uh, there was a link to see where those comments were, and that link actually didn't work. Okay. So those comments weren't available for review. Okay. So we can make Mr. Those... Pandini, I think. Okay. So we can make those two changes in the minutes. Um, this is a side note to the minutes, and it comes down to people that are online that are making a running commentary when we're not asking for public information, public participation. We ask for public participation at the beginning of a meeting, and on things that we have to vote on, we ask for public participation. But when somebody's just making a running commentary and there's been no request for public participation on a decision, should those comments be part of the uh, minutes of the meeting? That's a question that we have to decide here. I don't know what the legal part is. Uh, we may have to get something on there. It's not to change anything that we are looking at approving, but I would say going forward, we have to come up with some kind of position on, on that because we don't allow a running commentary in the meeting here. When we ask for public input on something, we record all that, but online individuals are able to just keep making comments even when there's been, for 15 minutes before or 15 minutes after, there's been no public participation request. So that's just something that I think that we need to address and talk about. Yeah, I totally agree. In this one instance, however, we did say in the meeting that those uh, comments would be Okay. No, no, that's and that's so why for I'm, that one instance, yes. But it, going forward, I'm totally in. Yeah, I, um, I'm not suggesting any changes as a result of that in these minutes. I'm just saying that going forward, whether it's today or at the next meeting, that we just have to make that decision that those will not be part of the public record. Yeah, I would like to see that. Okay. So, do we need an action item for the next agenda for that, Jack? Or uh, probably. So we'll make sure that act is an action item on the next agenda and we can have that discussion. Um, so with those two changes, was there a trustee who'd be willing to make a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, I will. I Thank motion you. that we approve the minutes for the month of September. With those two amendments? Those two, two amendments. I'll second that. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Ursula, how do you vote? Aye. I vote aye. aye. Okay. And Rebecca, is that you? Yep, aye. And Amy still hasn't joined us. So. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Uh, public comment. So this is the time for comment on public matters that are not on the main agenda. Members of the audience are encouraged to briefly address the trustees, uh, briefly being three minutes or less on the issue that is not on the agenda. 
Um, public matters do not include any pending legal matters, private personnel issues, private student issues. Um, so with that, are there, is there anyone who wishes to address the Board of Trustees? I do. Okay. Could you step to the podium? We have a microphone there so everyone can hear. Uh, state your name and... I have some documents to hand out to the board members. Okay. That's okay. Yep. My name is Sean Tandina and um, I live here in Kalispell. My kids uh, junior and senior in Flathead High School. Um, mm -hmm. Many of you know that I uh, have been opposed to the mask, uh, the, way, the position that the school board has on the mask. Thank you. If you, so every other one is, there's three pages. Oh, I need one of those. Uh, so I brought some documents tonight because um, there's been a, uh, every time I've seen stuff presented to this board, it's always been doom and gloom about the mask wearing situation. And tonight I brought a document from the Journal, journal of uh, the AMA, American Medical Association, the first document. And I highlighted here, it says face masks should be used only by individuals who have symptoms of respiratory infection, such as coughing, sneezing, or in some case fever. Face masks should not be worn by healthy individuals to protect themselves from acquiring respiratory infection because there's no evidence to suggest that face masks worn by healthy individuals are an effective uh, in preventing from becoming ill. Uh, so that's the first document from the AMA. Uh, the second document I brought is an OSHA document, which uh, specifically goes over, I own a business, and before I can require any one of my employees to wear a face mask, they must fill out this OSHA information sheet, which is, uh, and it has to be reviewed by a doctor to determine whether they are even safe, healthy enough to wear a face mask because of the detrimental effects that a face mask can have on one's health. This is an OSHA document that's been around for a long time. You can find it on the OSHA website. I don't know if you've had your teachers do this, but if you haven't, you might want to have them do it because they might not even be healthy enough to wear a face mask. I just wanted to make you aware of this. Um, and I feel like students probably are as important as your employees. And then the final document on here, just recently published uh, September 11th, 2020, um, this document is a study by the CDC uh, of a group of people who acquired COVID. So there's 154 case patients and 160 control participants. Um, and I highlighted on page four, uh, reported use of face cloth covering. Uh, they, they questioned these people, what had they done the prior 14 days? before they got COVID and there's a number of questions they asked, like did they go shopping, did they go to a restaurant? But there's also one in here about face masks. And it, it shows that the people that never, that answered never to wearing a face mask, only six out of 154 patients acquired COVID, where the people that said always wore face masks, 108 of the 154 case patients who always wore a face mask, somehow got COVID, but the ones who never wore it, only six. And then the control participants, it showed about the same data. There was five, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having trouble breathing. <clears throat> I, I am exempt to wearing a face mask, but the reason I'm in here in front of you is because I get one sentence in on those, I mean, you were just talking about the public comment. I get one sentence in and then you move on and I can't even make any more comments. So that's, that's why they continue to come in because I wasn't done talking. I get, you know, certainly not three minutes. And you got 30 seconds. <clears throat> okay. So uh, in the control group, five people out of 160 who never wear a face mask acquired COVID, whereas 118 who always wear a face mask acquired COVID. Now I certainly understand that you have uh, liability and there's a governor directive, but what I don't understand is why you went so much further than the governor's directive and not allowing medical exemptions in the school. Because in fact, most people, and you can see in this journal of a medical, uh, most people who are healthy individuals, it's actually detrimental to their health. 
Thank to you. Force them to wear a face mask for all the hours of the day that you have more masks. Thank, Thank you for bringing that mm -hmm. to our attention. Sam? Is it okay if I pull this down while I talk? It, it is okay. Okay, um, my name is Jess Nickelwright, and sorry, I have anxiety just from wearing this for that little bit of time. Um, my daughter is a sophomore here at Flathead High School, and my son is a junior. Um, there was an incident with my daughter three weeks ago where I had to come pick her up from school and take her home, and she was really upset by it, so I asked her to just write it, like write it out and writing is not one of her specialties and she hates it, but it, it's a good therapy for us. So I just wanna to read to you what she wrote down. That's okay. Hi, my name is Zoe Franz and I am a sophomore at Flyhead High School. Today, September 23rd, 2020, I was kicked out of school for not wearing my mask over my nose. I was in fifth period English with Mrs. Copez when she came over to me and she told me to put my mask over my nose. I responded with, oh, okay. And then she proceeded to ask me if I was going to do it. And when I refused, she told me I had 30 seconds to decide if I was going to put the mask over my nose or if I was going to be sent to the office. She took me out into the hallway and took me down to the assistant vice principal, Mr. Holloway. And they told me the requirements of wearing masks to clarify since they did not think I understood. And when I told them I knew the requirements of the masks, I also told him why I had it below my nose, because I was hot and had anxiety and felt like I couldn't breathe. Copez told me that that was unfortunate, but I still needed to wear it. Mr. Holloway then proceeded to tell me we needed to chat in his office. He then told me that I had to wear my mask over my nose and I told him I didn't want to wear one over my nose because I can't breathe. It would be over my mouth. And then I asked him if everyone else is wearing masks around me and they work, would it really hurt if I had my nose uncovered so I could breathe? He told me it's a guideline and I need to follow it and it didn't matter if all the other kids were wearing theirs. The fact was I didn't have it over my nose and I was told if I was going, wasn't going to comply with the guidelines that I would have to leave the building or be sent home. He then called my mom and he asked if there was anything they could do to get me to cooperate with wearing it over my nose. And she said no, that she was proud of me for standing up for my rights. So I sat in the room right before his office, which is closed off from the office itself because I didn't have my mask on while I was waiting for my mom. I did call Micah Hill twice and left two messages and have not had a response about that. Um, because I was told by Mr. Holloway the only, the only way to um, honor somebody with a medical condition in the mask is remote learning. And I obviously don't feel like that's a right. Like everyone has the right to fair education. And I feel like definitely remote learning is not a fair education. So we cannot learn remotely. And we went through this last spring when school closed. It was a really big struggle for her. Um, the fact that I got her to write her feelings was really huge, actually. So then I just have um, a couple more things. You have about 30 seconds. On the School District 5 website, you state active COVID and quarantine cases. Where are these numbers from? It's a time for comments rather than questions. Okay. Less than 1% of FHS students have been infected with COVID. Did you, did you threaten to shut down the school, restrict spectators at sports, or require masks with the seasonal flu, mono, or strep throat running rampant in the past few years? According um, to the emails about COVID from Principal Payne, no cases were due to student to student nor student to teacher contact. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to address the Board of Trustees? Okay, thank you. Uh, recognitions and student reports. Uh, Trig, I see you're here. Do you have anyone presenting or? We do not. Okay, but well, we got to build an update coming up. Pardon? But we have your building update coming okay. up. Okay. 
Uh, Flathead High School is Sydney Sydney Harp here. Hey Sydney, come on up. You could be right in front. And is there a microphone that uh, she can access? <laughs> uh, it's for the online people. For the online. People. Hello, my name is Sydney Harp. I am a senior at Flathead High School. I am from Tigers Prairie School, which is very far east of town. And um, I'm part of student council as a senior class representative. I, as part of my uh, curricular activities, I am part of Prophet Choir and Choral Layers, which is, if you don't know, it's the highest level of choir here. And it focuses on jazz music. It's really fun. And uh, in concert choir, I'm also a soprano two section leader. And another activity of mine is National Honor Society, which performs acts of community service. We mentor little kids. I don't know if we're going to be doing that this year due to the circumstances. But we also, we just, um, we put in 14 hours per semester for community service to oh no, it's seven, seven hours then, 14 hours total. It's a, yeah, it's a great honor to be part of it. And I also take, partake in three ID classes. I take Spanish four, English 12, literature and calculus. And the reason why I partake in those classes is to, is to challenge myself and also to achieve the merit distinction where if you test in three of those ID classes, you can get a distinction when you graduate. So as a part of student council, we we figure out what we're going to do for homecoming. And fortunately this year we couldn't have a dance, so nor can we have a large crowd at a game. So instead we still decorated the school. We we uh, decorated it. The main game was like 70s travel. And so we spent a day on the weekend. We decorated the whole school, and it looked very nice in the end. And we still had our Spirit Week dress-up days. So it was <coughs> Movie Monday, um, Hogan Tuesday, Wild West Wednesday, Time Travel Thursday, and Color Wars as usual. And in order to compensate for the dance, uh, we came up with three tournaments that students could partake in. We uh, came up with a corn pole tournament, a spike ball tournament, and a trivia contest, which proved to be great successes during the week. And um, some COVID changes that I could feel was, especially in choir, since the spread of COVID can, is, it's a great risk when you're singing because you project more respiratory germs. And so, we had to move our choir class to the auditorium for more space and to you know, uh, prevent spread. And another change to choir was we got special masks, resonance masks, which hold, I don't have them in my school right now, but it holds the mask a little bit away from your face. It provides an extra layer of protection. And it helps you sing out more. It's supposed to be helpful to help you breathe during singing. And uh, in all of my classes, we have an arranged seating chart in order to easily contact trace, which which is fine. We we have seating charts anyway. So, <laughs> and another new rule was wearing a mask all day, which a lot of people were concerned about in the beginning, but. I feel like now we've gotten the hang of it, and it's, this is now one of our new materials that we bring in every year, which is good to stay safe. Uh, for the ACT test, seniors took it last week for free because it was canceled in the spring due to the pandemic. And so a lot of seniors partook in that in order to gain scholarships. And so our activities this year, all of the athletics are still going except golf. And uh, our state cross country meet is next Friday. Uh, not next. Oh, it's not this Friday and Saturday. It's the next Friday and Saturday. And uh, we've had 
one theater production so far, and we've had one orchestra concert so far. So we're still holding on and continuing the product tradition of performing excellence. Um, so that's it. Thank you all for doing everything you can to support the students of Plata High School. I have two questions. I think other trustees might have a few others too. Okay. Um, the first one: How is sing in the auditorium as as, just, as a practice venue? Well, it's it's very different. The lighting is different, so a lot of people it's more relaxing in there. Uh, the seats aren't so harsh, <laughs> but uh, it has different acoustics. The choir room has like very great acoustics. We had to learn to project even more while we're in there, and That's pretty much the only change is the acoustics. Okay. Um, the other question is, you know, I know kids have had to be quarantined, and there's kids that have been actively COVID cases, um, and we don't always know who those are. But I'm guessing you kind of figure out when your friends aren't there. Do you think uh, kids, when they return, are stigmatized? I don't think so. I believe that a lot of people, when people come back, we understand, and it is annoying to get taken out of school, but it's ultimately for the best, and a lot of times it's due to the seating chart, why people are quarantined, and we don't know exactly who has it and who doesn't. So I, I think that everybody is very understanding if people have to take two or a week and a half off due to quarantine, and they just come back and it feels like we're back to normal. Thank you. Jack? All right, two questions. First one is, what's the most difficult part of the school year for you so far? And then what's been the easiest part of the school year for you? Um, well, I believe that the hardest part of the school year is probably all the missed spectator opportunities of sports and everything, because that is such a big part of high school life. Yeah, it's been hard on a lot of people. How about yourself, personally? Oh, yeah, I find it pretty hard because I do have a lot of school spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, we have to do it to, it's ultimately for the best. And what would be the easiest, has there been anything you can consider easy for the school year so far? Stephanie Hill, an international language student. Well, I'm going to let my um, students speak. Okay. So it's their show. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 If you could scooch the mic even a little bit closer to where they're talking, that would be great. Okay. So whoever's talking, if you can be really close to that microphone. 
You can probably even hold it in your hand and hold it up if you want. There you go. <laughs> um, so I'm Holly Schroeder. I'm a senior at Glacier High School, and I am taking both AP French and AP Spanish. Um, my name is Morgan Berry Schaefer. I'm also a senior at Glacier High School, um, and I'm enrolled in AP French. I'm not an overachiever. <laughs> uh, my name is Alexis Peck, and I'm actually a junior, and that means I am currently in French 3. Um, a lot has changed with the school year, as you heard from Sydney. It's, it, a lot is the same at Glacier High School. I mean, um, with our classes, there's the, the set seating arrangement with your last name and all that stuff, but a lot of the stuff with our French and Spanish club are still going on. Like our teacher, Madame, and my other teacher, Senora Hill, are still pushing kids to be involved in the clubs and, and like be involved and just stay interactive with the languages instead of getting lost and kind of not knowing which club to go into or, or just keeping interactive in both of them. Um, I'd have to agree with Holly, um, especially in my French courses. I've noticed that we are still able to do most of the learning activities that we did last year. Um, in learning, speaking, writing, and listening, um, which I find very helpful. I really am grateful for Madame for, for providing us with the, the necessi necessities that we need to, to still learn um, French language. And I think the hardest thing going into the shutdown last year was um, speaking, actually, because we were so used to um, speaking in French on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, and then, not. I mean, I have a sister who took AP French with Madame as well, but she doesn't live with me anymore, so I couldn't speak with her in French. So it was, that was the hardest part. Um, and now um, French club activities and Spanish club activities are uh, considered for um, academy points, which, which goes towards distinction, academy distinction. Um, so that's another thing that I really appreciate is there, there's more opportunity to, um, to still, still be involved, as Howie mentioned. Um, I'm personally involved in French clubs, like many of the students, as a French program, and we uh, we really enjoy uh, all the activities we do. And personally, I really enjoy that they're worth academy points, so I can rack them up early. And um, like the biggest difference, really, is that there's more social distancing involved. Uh, there's a lot of sanitizing, a lot of um, yeah, just respecting each other's space and uh, wearing masks, which to me personally, it isn't that big of a deal. And honestly, my face feels almost naked without a mask is how much I've personally gotten used to it. Can you explain what academy points are? Oh, okay. Um, so, may I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, academy points go towards our distinction. Um, I think it's... What is it, like the language distinction? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it goes for both uh, Spanish and French. It isn't like distinguished between the two specifically, I don't think. Um, and you have your portfolio, mm -hmm. which is basically like your application towards uh, getting that distinction uh, when you graduate and getting that cord. And uh, to do to accomplish that, you need 15 academy points, which can be earned uh, through exchange student programs, through uh, taking a second language, mm -hmm. and Café and Conversación, which is where we gather and communicate with each other in either French or Spanish for an, like, an entire hour and a half or so. Okay. Although this year it's more socially distanced and it's outside at Lawrence Park so that it's more COVID safe. Mm -hmm. and. I think that's basically sums it up. Um, I'd like to add along to that. So the um, you can take four years of one language. I'm taking four years of French. Um, the academy points are going to be part of my portfolio. Um, the other option is to take four years of one language, and Hallie's taking four years of French and Spanish. But the requirement is only two years of, of I would only have to take two years of Spanish to get that academy distinction. Um, 
I can barely speak English as it is, so I just decided <laughs> to stick with one language and, and go for all of those academy <laughs> points. Um, that's something I just wanted to add in is we, we have options for, for acquiring that language <clears throat> distinction. Thank you. Um, along with the changes, we, we didn't change a lot with what we do in class because with Spanish, we go online on Devoces, which is a digital like online learning academy for Spanish, and we do a lot of activities through that this year, but we've used many different sources for Spanish online, and we record on Seesaw for both classes, which is like either you create this little diagram of pictures to help you speak about what you're re re uh, presenting or um, talking about. And with Madame, sometimes it's a photo that you have to talk about. Like on a test, we talked about a cat that was sitting in grass. You have to talk for two to three minutes and then you just send it in. And we worked on that all last year and then we worked on it through um, when we got shut down through the pandemic. Um, I might just be the middle ground. And be the one that <laughs> <all this. laughs> We're just Mark. passing it around like a sacred <laughs> object. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned before, we're still able to do a lot of the activities that we usually do. Um, with Madame, she does, uh, we do uh, Marty Mondial, so we learn about a new place every every Tuesday. Marty is, is Tuesday in French. Um, <laughs> Wednesdays is Music Mercury. That's one of my favorite days from day one. Um, all of the alumni, all of the AP students, our freshman year, they always told us, you know, get involved, listen to French music or Spanish music, watch French movies, um, or, yeah, watch French movies. Try to do it without subtitles, but you can do it with subtitles as well. <laughs> um, and so every day of the week, we focus on, on speaking, um, listening, writing, and um, I'm missing the fourth one. I'm not really trying to remember it. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things we've still been able to do. Um, writing a journal, Judy, we usually have our own journals that we write in every week, and then Madame would usually take them. This year, the only thing that's changed with that is we take a piece of paper and then just hand it straight to Madame. So we don't have a journal of all the work that we've done, but Madame still keeps all of those, and I assume she might be giving them back to us at the end of the year so we can see our improvement <laughs> in the language. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, another thing I'd like to add that you see on the screen there is our Be Belgian pen pals. Um, we've only sent one letter back to them so far. Um, my Belgian pen, or <laughs> my Belgian pen pal, his name is Hugo. Um, he sent me one letter so far. They have to write us two paragraphs in English, and then they get to do their last paragraph in French. And for us, it's switched, so we have to write two paragraphs in French and then one in English. Um, and I thought it was really amazing to see. Um, the difference. Um, his his French was more basic, and my French was, or, or his English was more basic, and mine, my French was more basic. And so I, I think that contrast is really interesting to see. Do you know what your pen pal is doing for school? Um, I, he didn't say if they were for were in session full capacity or not. Um, I do know that he is in um, his his last year of school right now. My Belgian pen pal is named Laura. And um, she's a delight. And not all of them uh, actually mentioned uh, whether, like, exactly like what they were doing in school or what they do after school. Uh, I, I imagine conversations like that will continue as we move forward. Although it takes a while for <laughs> poor Madame to scan every letter that we give her <laughs> and then send it over in a mass email. But uh, we. We're all very excited for it, and we absolutely love being in French class. And for in terms of like Belgian pen pals, that's all I really have to say. Do you have anything to add? Um, my Belgian pen pal is pretty cool too. <laughs> um, uh, she definitely had a very like complex French sentences that I definitely like used Madonna as like a freaking dictionary, but. Um, <laughs> She just walked around the room, was like helping everybody with one word, so mm -hmm. that was pretty nice. But other than that, we don't really have um, any pen pals in Spanish yet. I'm sure Senora is looking for it. I mean, um, it is definitely helping to see someone like their their um, first language, like talking to us and like sending us things and asking us questions, and then us writing them back. So it definitely helps. Well, I have something to add for like the way it hasn't changed. Um, part just real briefly. Um, French class is a very interactive class, 
and thankfully we haven't had a lot of situations where a lot of people are removed. Um, well, I say a lot in relativity, but there have been a few here and there uh, due to quarantine. And because of that interactive nature, it's sometimes difficult for people to do online, but otherwise Madame does an excellent job of uh, setting up times like, hey, I'm free on Google Meet on this area, in which case we can still practice speaking because <laughs> that can only improve through people who are more experienced at it than us. And I feel like that's pretty normal. Um, so in the spring, well, early start of winter, we signed up for the actual field test that you could either choose to take in Spanish or French. Um, I signed up to take both, and during the pandemic, that obviously got shut down, but then it was rescheduled for us to take it online. It was definitely um, a challenge, but I actually, I actually enjoyed taking it online as it was, it was easy and easy to follow. I mean. Um, I'm excited to take it this year to advance and to earn the seal on my diploma. So I'm looking forward to moving further with those languages. Um, I'd have to agree with that. Last year, um, in the midst of being shut down, um, like I mentioned before, we weren't able to have the same day-to-day -day, uh, French communication that we did before. Um, so the hardest part of the seal was the, the speaking portion, the writing, listening, um, all of that was, we, we all blew through that pretty easily. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe. Um, I didn't earn the seal last year. Um, I took it as a junior. Um, but this year, I think it, it has really prepared me, especially online. Like, it, it's just, you know, made me feel better about taking it this year as a senior. Uh, I personally have not taken the seal test yet due to me still just starting my junior year. But I do plan on taking it, and I'm actually pretty excited for it because I've been working really hard in French and to pr improve my French and to have that recognized um, that I'm really proficient in it would be an absolute honor to me. So I'm excited to take it. Um, in terms of online testing, while it isn't this specifically, I did take an AP World History test online because it couldn't be done in person. And uh, again, AP, di AP tests are different than the SEAL tests but it was kind of a struggle for me uh, because I was in my room rather than uh, a professional space. So for me, it was kind of difficult to flip that switch and get going on that test. But other than that, I think all my school was pretty good. I think there's one more slide on there. I could be wrong. I don't think so. But if, I think um, if you wanted to talk about the traveling or traveling abroad this summer oh, if you're right. doing that trip. I am. So uh, Glacier uh, Goes Global is a program where we send our students and to go across the world for like 10 days to broaden their cultural perspective, to improve their language, uh, language barrier. Uh, so what's the word? <laughs> I can't think of the word, but either way, we work around language barriers and we think through problems, and it's a really amazing opportunity. Uh, and in the summer of 2021, me and a bunch of other students, um, as well as chaperones and madame, are going to go to Portugal and Spain, and uh, it's all planned out, and hopefully if everything goes well and we're approved uh, to continue with it and... Um, COVID doesn't get in the way in any form, way, shape, or form. We are all very, very excited for it. We've invested our money into it. Of course, there are refund programs that we can get our money back if something were to occur, and there's like voucher programs where if we have to miss it, they'll give us a voucher so we can travel in our own time. And it's a great opportunity for students, and it just, I don't know how to explain it because <laughs> there's no way to explain the pure joy and excitement that I feel every time I think about going on that trip, trying all the food, seeing all the places and the historical buildings and learning about the cultures that's there and just broadening my perspective and being a better global citizen. I wasn't able to go. I'm a senior now, so I can't go on the, the trip or the student's trip. Um, and I couldn't go on the one that I was eligible for. Um, and 
it, it made me really, it was just because of work. I was working last summer, so I wasn't able to take that time off work to go on the trip. Um, and I, I pretty much cried to my dom. I was like, I need to go on this trip with you. So then I keep telling her, I, I keep telling her, I'm like, what if I just happen to be in Europe when you're all there and tag along with you? Um, but even after high school, I plan on traveling abroad. Um, I just wish I could have done it with, with Glacier's program because I think that would have been super amazing. Um, I haven't traveled with Glacier's program that they do, but I did sign up for a scholarship freshman year with ASS, and I won the 5200 scholarship okay. um, to travel abroad to Spain my um, freshman summer going into um, sophomore. And it was amazing. I mean, I lived with a host family for a week, and then we went and stayed at the college in Madrid. And it, I can only, like, push people to sign up and go on the trip with Madame because it was so eye-opening to be um, in someone else's culture and live in someone else's house and see how they make food and how they sit down as a family and just be involved with all of that. Well, thank you. Uh, trustees, are there questions for our presenters? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our building update. Uh, Calspell Middle School and Principal Mr. Principal Johnson. So do we need to hold this? Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> you can hold it too. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> or spread out. Okay. I just wanted to do Dallas. Uh, I'm Trey Johnson, principal at the middle school. Um, don't know me. Dallas Stuker, our assistant principal. And then Ann Catherine is our new assistant principal and athletic director. Uh, she picked a great time to be an athletic director. It's hard enough. <laughs> but then, in this unique year, uh, yeah. kicked off the training wheels really early, yep. and so uh, she's been doing a great job for us. Um, in the past, we've talked kind of about our uh, academic achievement with math and language arts, kind of how our teachers work on collaborating a lot, teaming. <clears throat> Tonight, we didn't really have a big presentation set for you. I just really want to brag on our kids and our teachers, um, kind of going into this year. Um, our teachers have just kind of just everything that we've had to give them in terms of teaching um, and then all the COVID stuff from masks to, to sanitizing to cleaning to sanitizing back to cleaning to trying to spread kids out, you know, keeping sixth graders spread apart. Um, they've just done a fantastic job. Then as we've had to go with a lot of kids getting quarantined, we've had a lot in our building that have gotten quarantined. We've had a lot of kids that have had to go remote. Um, and now our teachers, they're kind of at the point where they're kind of killing themselves to serve our kids that are in school and our kids that are in quarantine or have tested positive and have to be home for a couple weeks. Uh, putting in a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of hours, trying to meet the demands of both. And then we have our rec teachers who've done a great job of developing a really strong uh, remote, remote program there as well. Um, you know, and, that, and that's, again, kind of at the start of this year. They just took it on, tried to become a team, and I think we've got 160-something in our remote program, and we've got a lot of kids flourishing and doing really well there. And then our kids in our building, are, they've come in, and they've, they've do, they, they do what we ask. You know, in the hallways, hey, let's back up a little bit. You know, they've always got their masks on. We've got to remind some kids. Um, you know, that happens on, on a fairly regular basis, but they, they – they're, they're willing to do it. They want to be at school. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's just, like I said, it's an amazing group of adults, our teachers, and our kids. Um, and so with that, I, you know, I thought we would probably just maybe you guys had questions for us, kind of how is this, this unique school year going, and, and maybe we can answer them for you guys. Mark? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to go on the tour this morning, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, we had a few here, so it was good. Yeah, yeah we didn't see you there. <laughs> <laughs> and we lost Jack, so don't feel bad. Thank you. Jack was on the self guided tour. <laughs> yeah. um, but I am really glad to hear what's uh, been going on, especially at middle school. I know it's been really tough with quarantine. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on, on how much extra. Uh, 
teachers have been working versus a, a non COVID year. Uh, do you guys have a perspective on that? Is it, is it wearing on people? And how many fights of adult fights do you have to break up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll jump into that just as somebody who's just come out of the classroom. Yes, it is, it is definitely extra work on them. Um, the teachers that I have spoken to have talked about just, you know, having the kind of reconfigured area. Right, I am only going to do X number of hours at home at night because I can be on answering emails 24 7. And um, we had some teachers sort of volunteer worship to take kids into their classrooms at lunch to. Sort of open up some space in the, in the lunch in the lunchroom, and someone said, "I just can't do it. I need my lunch hour to be answering emails to kids that are at home." So it is, and then just just the the learning curve of figuring out the technology. We have some who are amazing at just filming themselves once a day. They put that up there in classrooms, so it doesn't matter if kids are in class at home, they can see what the lesson is. And then others that they have to learn that. That's a big learning curve, and that takes time and energy just to learn all of that technology and kind of how to do those things. Yeah, it's, I don't know, maybe uh, six to ten extra, you know, maybe a couple extra hours a day, maybe, maybe an hour, two hours a day, above what they would be normally doing. Right. I think, uh, I, I think too, it depends on, you know, how comfortable they are with that technology piece, and so some could be spending more time than others based on that. We staffed in a couple rooms today, and one of the teachers, I think, said he was about, you know, six extra hours a week. Um, and so even even if you you know just video your lesson every day, that's not maybe a ton of work if you're pretty proficient with that. But then you get the emails and the questions and and all that sort of thing. The, the supporting afterwards is what is what takes those people's time too. So. And then reconfiguring lessons. I mean, some of our cur curriculum is right is online, so it's pretty easy. But then some of it isn't, and so they are creating their lessons and having to put that into Google Classroom. And so just that that kind of switch of and I'd just add that uh, Lynn Ryder adds to that that they're tired. Their report and extra work is draining both emotionally and physically. And they're, and they're doing it to the point where they're killing themselves, kind of. Yeah. Craig, I know we got some new windows at KMS. Is, yes. And I know we have some sewer things. Yeah. Been addressed. Yeah. And the tour didn't want to go check out the so in the <laughs> apparently in the tunnel, we have we have tunnels all over. But in the tunnel under our life skills and counselor's office, um, we had what we think was an old clean out that did not get capped from our one of our main sewer lines that go down was this the four six inch to the eight six, inch? Six inch to four inch to six inch. So this was it was in the four inch line that eventually drops into the six inch line. Um, so I think it might have happened during our remodel construction, um, and so it was there and it was all fine until the six the, the six inch line or the four inch line plugged up uh, ahead of the cleanup, and so then it it's backed up and then it went into the clean out and then it dumped into the tunnel area. Um, and that could have been too just uh, it could have been six months of not much movement in our in our pipes and stuff. But at any rate, this August we kind of started noticing a strange smell. First we thought it was like a dead mouse or something in the in the <laughs> counselor's office. It's like no we, it took forever and finally Tim Schulte is like, you know, we better look underneath. <laughs> and so I went to the trap door in the life skills room. We opened it up and it just blew us back. And, uh, so it wasn't about the kangaroo. <laughs> yeah, 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 a really big kangaroo. So uh, we had a re restoration company come in and they had to take like all that out. Uh, they took a lot of dirt out. A lot of the one guy said he was he was shoveling 12 inches and it wasn't dirt. Mm. Um, <laughs> so it was it was pretty pretty gross. But we got it, they got it restored and it's been great. So I guess the other part of the question was really kind of looking ahead. What else at KMS is a priority for you, for a facility standpoint? No, we we have more windows. I, I said the windows are I think are our biggest thing. Um, and then the univents, I mean our univents are 50 years old and they're kind of outdated technology, but they're also very high ticket item price wise. Those are probably our two biggest things that we've got to. 
wrap our arms around, you know, and spend more time putting the plumbing in. Scott? Yeah. Trigger Dallas, you guys, I found a very interesting today just the change you made in the passing career to reduce the number of kids in the hallway. Can one of you talk about how you came up with that and what it did to your um, schedule? You're the, you're the math guy, so. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm the math schedule guy here. So, uh, yeah, so we have our buildings kind of broken up. Most of the eighth graders are kind of in one section of the building. The seventh graders are in a different section of that hallway, and then the sixth graders in the back of the building by themselves in the pod. And so really we just took our schedule and uh, we just have a bell at eight and a bell at three now and no bells the rest of the day. And the teachers are, you know, are kind of getting used to um, setting a timer or something so they remember to, to let the kids go. But we have the eighth grade and sixth grade on the same schedule because they're kind of separated in the building. And then the seventh grade is at a different passing time because their um, their area kind of connects to the eighth grade area. So we just needed to, to separate those, um, the seventh and eighth grade. So in in the hallway, um, it's not it's not nearly as crowded. We'll have instead of a four minute passing period, we have really an eight minute because you see the eighth graders go by, and then it kind of clears out, and the seventh graders go by. But we've got a lot of good feedback on that, you know, staff and students too. Like, hey. It's we need to keep this because it's not, you know, it's, we, we haven't had, and we haven't had the issues either. We always, you know, have some, some hallway issues where somebody spoke to me or tripped me or well, these guys are wrestling and then it started out friendly, but then it hasn't been friendly, stuff like that. And I don't think we've had one hallway issue this year. So, so it's been kind of nice. Yeah, I noticed when we were up there that the hallways during passing were not very congested and the kids were able to just move. And they've also done a good job. You know, our, our team at the team kind of talked about, hey, we can't have you guys at the lockers every time. So the kids have kind of designated times when the kids go to their locker. So it's not after every period. Because our lockers sit on top of each other, and we'd have, you know, 300 kids in that area. So they kind of, the teams have kind of adjusted, hey, okay, take, take, bring materials for two classes, and then you'll go to your locker. And so that's helped too. Jeff? Uh, going back to curriculum delivery, and you have uh, uh, Google Meet that is the basic tool. How many other different tools are being used, and, and how are the teachers uh, collaborating with others to share those tools or to help them out? Or <clears throat> well, who's the uh, source for uh, uh, working through some of the software issues and or some of the hardware issues besides the help desk or the, or the tech mentors? How well is everybody getting along? Because and, and, it's a whole new <laughs> teaching method now. Yeah, I would say, you know, we, and that was kind of the, the plan going in when we got the, uh, the two extra days at the beginning of the year for training. We have some staff members that are on top of it. And so we spent, we offered five, five or six different training sessions um, that were like 45 minutes long each or a half hour long each. Actually, I think they were 45 minutes long. And so they would present something. And so our teachers, and we had to, we wanted to divide our state staff up so that they did all, we didn't want 90 teachers in one room and one computer room. We wanted to spread them out and socially distance. So we would offer four different training day sessions, and teachers could pick and choose what session they would go to. And it was, I can't remember what they were, but all the different parts of Google, Google, how to uh, better run a Google Meet. Um, a couple of different platforms, yeah, Edpuzzle. Um, yeah, Edpuzzle, Bitmoji, uh, Screen Capify. Website design. Yeah. Um, Google Jamboard. Yeah, but, but I think I think to answer, I mean, as things go, he's all staff is also helping staff. I mean, so within a team, somebody may say, "Hey, I got this figured out," and they're you know they're showing each other how to do it. So you know, the other day when I was in a class and 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 the teacher had three Chromebooks up because three kids that were in quarantine were sitting on the Chromebooks at their at their desk, you know. So just kind of working through those issues. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty interesting to see, and I think that's a credit to the teachers too. They just kind of keep figuring out ways to do it. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions? Yes, I have a question. This is Rebecca Linden. Um, Trig, when you first started speaking, you said something like teachers are killing themselves with the extra work of dealing with um, quarantine students. And, you know, of course, nobody really wants teachers to kill themselves. Um, do you have any solutions or things that have worked within your building for taking some of that strain off or suggestions for what the district could consider doing? Well, we kind of actually, and, and it's interesting too, because there was a point where this, where uh, after Labor Day, the sky was falling. Because we had a bunch of teachers get positive, we had a bunch of students, and we had teachers out. We didn't have subs. Um, a bunch of kids went into quarantine, and, and we were we were chicken little. We were we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, we did talk with our te our teachers. Actually, came to us in, in our department head meeting and said, "Hey, because we were kind of thought, oh, we're going to have to go remote, which we don't want to do ever. Um, even if the governor were to move phases, we don't want to." But what we talked about doing was, is there any way to go to a four-day week? And we have a fifth day that would be a remote learning day uh, and also kind of the prep the prep work day as well. Um, so we, we talked about that um, and talked about trying to do... Uh, trying to do an early out every Wednesday. So, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a, a full day, but it would be a give the teachers a couple hours midweek to catch their breath, um, but still see the kids five days a week. Yeah. So yeah, those those were kind of the two things that came out from our building. Um, and, and I shouldn't just say yeah. catch their breath. I mean, it gives them two hours to answer emails, to you know, upload whatever they need to upload, to work on their curriculum. So they yeah. they're, they're not going to be sitting around drinking coffee. For <laughs> Yeah, one thing I learned uh, through all this too is you never just say, "Oh, just go post your assignment online," because you'll get you'll get you'll get, you'll get the death stare. Because it's, it's way <laughs> more than that. I mean, there's instructions, there's there's screens, there's slides, there's there's videos to post with it. It's not like you just post something online. Um, and then once you do post it, then you get the 35 emails because they didn't read the instructions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it is pretty labor intensive. So would one day online possibly end up with more work with, you know, needing to prepare for an online class, or is that not a concern? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a concern. I think that that idea, Rebecca, kind of came out of, because they thought, oh, oh, we might be, because, like we said, we thought the sky, the, the sky was falling, that we, we might have to go full-time remote, and they just don't want to. They would rather see something where, Let's try to keep it going, but uh, we need that day to kind of have the time to, to work on all the remote stuff. So, so right awesome. now, I think time is needed somewhere for them. Understood, and thank you, and thank you for that um, wonderful tour today. Um, your solution in the hallways would seem brilliant. Thanks. Any other questions? Kelly. Oh, Kelly. I just wanted to acknowledge something that the middle school has done uh, this, this over the years. They have um, been in a teaming model, which is a highly successful model, and their data, their achievement scores uh, support that. But interestingly enough, when they were working on the remote education center model for middle school students, they kept in a teaming model. Those teachers that are currently teaching in the, the REC program are teaming, and they have just done an amazing job. Uh, they're consistent on their communication that goes out to parents on a weekly basis. They meet twice a week in TLC. Uh, they are trying to be consistent with their assessments, their grading philosophy, I and mean, they, have, they have really embraced and continued that team model in a remote education uh, program. So hats off to you guys. They met for a couple hours today and did a strategic plan on the transition for the middle school into trimester two for the remote education center and how that would look, what the communication timeline would be and all that. So they are they are way ahead of the curveball on many, many levels, but hats off to the leadership there. So thank you and thank the teachers. Yeah. Credit to them. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you.
you all. And thanks, all right. thanks to KMS. Yes, We're thank proud you. of you. Yep. Thank you, guys. Yep. So, Ann, is Dallas helping you at all, or is he just leaving you high and dry? I don't know. He asked him when I shut my door. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> all right. No, I couldn't do it <laughs> Bold business, monthly financial reports, information only. Uh, Gwen, I think that's you. Yeah. So, um, and you've, you know, seen this monthly budget report before. Uh, we're early in the year, so... Nothing really unusual or remarkable to see there, but as we go through the year, it's a good way to, um, particularly this year where we're, we're projecting a shortfall, it'll be a good way to see, you know, how are we doing? Are we, you know, are we doing better than we thought we would? Which would be our hope. So the first half of that report is elementary, the second half is high school. Every fund is listed there, the budget, is listed and then the expenditures and commitments are the purchase orders. So the ba uh, budget balance in the top group, the bottom group is our cash funds. So then we convert to talking about cash balances. And we're 75% of the year is remaining and we're anywhere from 75% to 100% of the budget remaining depending on which budget you're talking about. And then the far right-hand side are the revenue, uh, is the revenue information. So in some of those funds, we had cash to reappropriate. And then um, the second to the last column is the revenue received year to date. So, and then again, um, we're 25% uh, of the way through the year. And so we should be in this, somewhere in the range of 25 have received 25% of our revenue. And um, uh, the, the one thing that I always like to point out has to do with the, we, we have a reserve in certain funds. And in the general fund, it's 20% of, um, of our budget authority. And by this time of the year, we pretty much um, dipped very heavily into the reserve because we don't have any taxes received yet. So I just am always uh, want to talk about how important it is to have the reserves. And sometimes when we're in difficult budget times, we're like, well, maybe we should use the reserve. But we really use the reserve every year from in September and October uh, until we get our first tax payment in November. So just important to have the reserves. So that's the monthly budget report. Uh, next up is the health insurance, I believe. Right. And so um, there's a preliminary September um, financial for health insurance, preliminary because we don't actually have our statements yet from the county treasurer's office. County treasurer is our bank, so we don't have our bank statements to make certain that, you know, all of our numbers reconcile. But we wanted to take a stab at uh, seeing what September looks like in the health insurance realm, because in July and August, we don't collect any premiums because most of our people aren't working in July and August. So we collect their premiums from September through June. But if you scroll down um, to the far right-hand corner, you'll see that um, that actually September keeps, uh, yeah, right there. Okay, so um, our net revenue uh, to date is $482,000. So we're, we're to the good in the health insurance as we start out and hopefully that trend will continue. The district contributed an additional $700,000 right up front in July to the health insurance fund and employees are pay, employees who are on the plan are paying an additional uh, $57 a month on top of their health insurance premiums to help right the shortfalls that have taken place over the last three years. So uh, we think we're on the right track there. And then lastly is, that, well, the August financials are there and they're ugly. 
$1.2 million in the negative, but again, because no revenues collected for the most part in July and August. So I didn't want to start out with that report, so we <laughs> added a September to get us a little closer to something that we can live with. So, but it, you know, the reports are in your packet if you want to look through that till, uh, July and August. And then thirdly is the food service financials. And of course, this is, an, uh, we want our food service program to pay for itself. Many, as a matter of fact, most school districts use general fund money to, uh, to subsidize their health, their um, food service program. We don't want to do that in Kalispell, and so far we've been successful in avoiding that, and we want to continue to do that. And so, again, if you scroll down just a little bit, Kelly, um, you can see that uh, we're, we're in a positive uh, profit and loss statement of $119,000. Uh, so, um, you know, we're off to a good start in both of those, and hopefully that will be the trend that we see throughout the year. Uh, we did get noticed yesterday that um, that the federal government is going to continue that uh, the program where all students eat free through the end of the school year. So initially it was through December and now they've extended that. And that's actually a very good thing because it is confusing for parents that, oh, this week um, I don't have to worry about lunch breakfast and lunch for my child, but then next week I'm back to, you know, paying for that. And so it's hard to make those transitions. We've made them a couple of times already, so I'm glad we're not going to make that again. So. Hey, Gwen, is it all, so it seemed like it was anyone under the age of 18 this summer. Is it still that, or did they change it to students? And yes. do those students have to be KPS students, or are they, you know, how does that, um, how are we defining that? Technically, it is students during the school year. The summer, it's every child, right, from zero to 18. Although we have opened up uh, to our rec students, so if they call the the central kitchen and 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 request meals, they will they can go there and pick up an entire week's worth of material. Uh, meal preparation items. Will those so, things be available, like coming up here, we got a four-day weekend. Will they be available for things like that, or winter break, spring break? Yeah, you know, uh, last year on spring break we did because we were in the COVID time. Um, you know, I don't know that we really discussed that, but there's a backpack program that sends meals home with students, but that's, that's a good point, Lance. We do need to and I know that everybody's so busy just trying to stay ahead of things that we probably haven't looked down the road and went, oh, you know, we've got uh, certainly those families that have picked up their me their week's worth of meals will be in a good place because they're good for those extra days. Um, you know, I'll, I'll visit with Jana about that and see what we can do. And then we should think about the holiday breaks and that sort of thing. That's a good point, Len. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the food service is working hard, and they've been hit hard as well with some um, <coughs> contact tracing and employees who've been ill. So, but they're holding it together. So, yeah, and I think Jana said that uh, they were doing 300 to 400 meals a week for the REC. So, we've got about 12, 15 families that, that take advantage of that right now. So, yeah, so they've had a lot of interest in that. Yeah. A lot of moving parts on food service. Thank you. Any other questions for Glenn? Will? Yeah, Glenn. You said that the um, reserves are used to cover expenses, and that's one reason why we need to have reserves. Are you, do you feel comfortable with the level of reserves we have? Well, we have the maximum reserves. Oh, there's a cap. Yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and our reserves are all full, and that's important. The other important reason for that is that when you are attempting to sell bonds, you get a better bond rating if your reserves are full and, and you've shown good fiscal responsibility, you know, in, in all of your reporting and that sort of thing. So 
that too. And we, we know that more than likely we'll be building again soon. Um, so that's the other reason to keep them full. But yeah, we max, we keep all of our reserves at maximum, so. Uh, another question I have is um, uh, for the health insurance program and the clinic, uh, we're now in like this COVID period. Uh, have you noticed any difference in usage of the clinic or um, is there more because of COVID or less? Or? Well, I think it's, we're probably a little early to tell if we had more years to compare to, but right, we opened in May. And of course, the no one was even going to the doctor in, you know, March, April, May. Mm -hmm. um, then this summer we got, we had some periods of a lot of use. And then when school first started, the, the usage was reduced again, but we're seeing it pick up. We really are. And I don't know that they've seen a lot of patients for COVID purposes. I, or, nothing yeah. is scary happening. What's that? There's nothing scary happening financially. <laughs> no, no. And actually Jack worked on some financials that, that show that we're actually doing a little better than what we thought we were going to do. And Jack, feel free to speak to that. The, the big part that I have that hasn't been answered yet, trying to get some data on it, is a lot of the usage in, in May, June, July was what's called an annual health assessment. So that's, they, they go in, they get some labs done, then they go in again and they meet with people to discuss the labs and come up with a plan. So, and I don't know if that was 50% of the appointments plus or minus. So without the annual health assessment, and if it was 50%, and I don't know that for sure, then the other 50% was just normal visits that somebody would have. So, and the purpose of the health assessments is to help people come up with baselines and preventative care so that they don't have so much frequency later on down the road. And it's hard to measure that value. We like to think that that value exists and that it'll save the plan money later on. So the utilization has kind of a little uh, a mystery because so a, a significant amount or a large part of it has to do with future preventative issues versus pre present issues to address. And we're, and we're in the process of trying to analyze that, or at least I am, to try and make sure, understand just what kind, not that it's going to make any difference in how the clinic's going to be used, but it just helps understand the utilization. And in, in all cases, we just have to encourage people to utilize it more. But to, to try and arrive at a question like what you're throwing out, there's no data to, to, to back anything. It's just uh, some observations on, on how, how it's being promoted and uh, guesses on how it's actually being used. So one other just anecdotally um, bit of information is that the caregivers really believe they're seeing people who haven't been to the doctor for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And that was really one of our goals is that people feel like they can go and get their annual checkup. It's convenient. You can book your appointment on, your, on, the, on their app. Um, and that, and they're really finding that, and that was a group of people that we really wanted to reach because that's important that you stay, obviously, you know, that you stay on top of your healthcare needs. So they really feel like we are reaching a group of people that have not been using the doctor for one reason or another. So that's, that's positive. The motivating aspect of what Gwen is talking about is there were a couple, one for sure, and I think there were two over the last five years that uh, hadn't been to a doctor and had a real big health issue that turned very expensive. And I don't know any of the, any of the details about it, but it, it, that's the motivating factor by itself to get people in to see, because it, it sounded like, at least for the one person, if they had been in there earlier and caught it earlier, they wouldn't have gone through anything like what they went through. One last, last question. You mentioned that the food program is self-funding. 
uh, what is the revenue for that? Well, the bulk of the revenue, it's a combination of um, parents purchasing meal tickets for children and federal reimbursement. And when on these, in these times when no children pay for their lunch uh, or breakfast tickets, it's important that we increase our numbers of students participating because there's different rates of reimbursement for free students, reduced students, and then students who normally would be paying. There is a small reimbursement for them, but it's quite small. Mm -hmm. And so as we transition between the model where parents are buying uh, meal tickets and parents aren't buying meal tickets, we have to you know, do everything we can to increase our utilization to help offset um, that revenue that we would have gotten for students whose parents would normally be buying their tickets. So it's, um, but those are the sources of revenue. But it's, okay. uh, you really have to work hard at making certain it's, that it, it pays for itself. Because like I said, most, that doesn't happen in most places, so. Gwen, are we still strongly encouraging people to fill out their free and reduced school lunches? Yeah, we actually really need people to. And so, again, this program where uh, there's no payment for meals, doesn't really encourage the paperwork to be completed, but we need it for uh, Title I, we need it for E-rate. Um, so, and, and really, kind of our mantra is, we would like every parent to fill it out, even though you know already that you probably don't qualify, you might not actually know that because you'd be surprised at, um, at what those numbers look like. So we just really try to encourage people for everyone to fill it out and then we process them and then many of them will never be used, but at least we've got our numbers for, for those other programs. And it is hard to collect the paperwork when there's really no benefit yeah. to it. Yeah. And then just moving back and forth from one program to the other is, is really uh, making that difficult. But the principals in the buildings really encourage parents. To, to complete the paperwork. You could also do it online. Um, so I think there's a concerted effort being made to get people to complete paperwork, um, but it is a struggle for sure. Jack? Uh, two, two side notes. One is I stumbled across, I don't know if anybody else saw the NBC Montana uh, local uh, uh, produce thing that talked about apples from Finley Point and other things, I thought that was pretty interesting. And I talked, stopped and talked to uh, Jana this, uh, after the KMS visit when I was lost. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she just talked about the significant amounts of fruits and vegetables that are going out in the meals compared to in past years, just because you got to seal everything out and send it out and there's no salad bars anymore or anything like that. And, and the local uh, uh, produce and, and fruits that are being utilized, and I just thought that was, you know, NBC Montana showed that, but I don't know how much that really gets out and that the community can appreciate the local aspect of it. Yeah. It's nice to look in the warrants, you see, you know, Lower Valley Meat Processing, you see Terrapin Farms and all the organic farms in the areas. It's nice the School District 5 is reaching out to those local businesses. Uh, other questions for Glenn? Thank you, Gwen. Yep, thank you. Old business, monthly financial, oh, I'm sorry, policy updates. Policy updates, so this is the second of three readings for um, uh, some policy changes that came through MTSDA as a result of some uh, changes in the law. Um, and Tracy's also on with us, and I'm gonna have her uh, give you a, a brief five minute kind of overview Policies are in there. We've talked about it twice now at policy committee. Uh, Tracy actually attended a uh, training with Dea Kaleva from Kaleva Law Offices, who's also at times worked with our district. Um, and to get a little bit better sense of what the nuances are to the changes. And um, Kelly, if you would open up that update piece. Yep. 
And coming out of the policy committee, there's no no recommendation to try and change any of the language there. There's been a lot of changes, some, a lot of deletions and additions. Um, and I'm going to let Tracy talk a little bit just about the, uh, the overview, the training, what it means for the district. Um, you know, in general terms, not a lot has changed from the district's perspective on how we handle it, but they have clarified some new things in there. And uh, Tracy, I'll let you you go from here. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. So we just started out, I think most of you are familiar with the definition of sexual harassment, but I wanted to put that in there just kind of to anchor the conversation so that you're aware of the different three categories that we look, um, we look to, uh, to define the activity as sexual harassment or not. And then if you go down, Kelly, I'm not going to spend too much time in that because that's kind of the law, uh, or not kind of the law, but that's the law, and I know that you have reviewed it. But we're going to be going over three areas of discussion tonight. And if you could go back up just a little bit, Kelly, on those three points. So when should the school respond to a sexual harassment allegation? How should the school respond? And then the next steps that um, I'll be taking along with the fellow uh, Title IX coordinators. So when should the school respond to sexual harassment allegations? This is where the law has changed a little bit in terms of reporting. And it's, it defines as actual knowledge of sexual harassment. And so where we will need to make sure that we do some additional education is it could be overhearing two students talking. It could be a custodian overhearing two students talking. It could be somebody else that's not necessarily in a um, in an administrative position. And so that is a little bit of a broader definition in terms of who does have to report and when did we receive the actual knowledge. And so that's going to be something that we will train our staff on because it could be a food service worker, it could be a custodian, it could be a maintenance person, it could be a teacher, um, administrator, anybody. But as soon as they hear that, that's when that when that clock starts ticking. So if you go down a little bit, I did provide some information on what actual knowledge is, but I'll allow you to kind of review that. And then how should the school respond to sexual harassment allegations? This is pretty consistent with what, with what we have been doing, except for there's a little bit more definition and um, role separation um, in this process now. So you have a Title IX coordinator, then you have an investigator, and then you have a decision maker. And those are really um, clearly defined roles and they have different expectations. The one thing is that um, neither the coordinator or the investigator can be the decision maker. So there's a really strong line between people that are doing the investigation and supporting and then the person that makes the decisions. We're going to be doing more training on this next week as it, um, as it relates to those three roles and how they've changed in the law. This just goes on to talk to you a little bit about the basic, um, the basic roles of the Title IX coordinator. Right now, we do have four Title IX coordinators, myself from a district level, and then Mark Dennehy, Bryce Wilson, and then Ann Castron. And I will be mostly coordinating it from the district level, most of the time, especially when you're dealing with students, um, the, the buildings are gonna be handling that. I wouldn't necessarily get involved. I am the primary person involved in staff to staff though, or staff to student. Um, but when it's student related, most of the time they take care of that. And then it goes on to talk about the investigator. Um, there's definitely timelines that we've always had uh, that we want to make sure that we continue to comply with. And then the decision maker. And one thing with the decision maker is that they do not, they do not recommend that it is the school board that is the decision maker in this case. And so we would want to make sure that that was an individual. Uh, maybe it could be it could be Micah in some cases. It could be myself in some cases, as long as I'm not the Title IX coordinator or the investigator. And so those roles will be determined based on each situation that we have. Who's going to do what role in this case? What makes the most sense? One key change to this that is a pretty um, significant change, 
as it relates to the law is that um, you you have to have the Title IX investigation process completed before any disciplinary measures are handed out. And so in the past, you were able to, let's say you had two students that um, one student was sexually harassing another student. You could go ahead and remove that student and put them in a different classroom. At this point in time, that could be considered punitive. And so that would not be something that we, um, that may not be something that we can do in a particular situation. So we have to be, we have to remain very neutral um, during the process. And, um, and then, um, you know, trying to support that person, support the victim and also the person that the allegations were brought forward to. Um, and that's going to be a really unique challenge. So it's something that we'll work closely with legal on um, as we move through this process and apply this new law to um, upcoming situations if we have them. So the next uh, the next uh, steps that we're going to be doing is obviously just making sure that our current practices and processes are in compliance with the law in terms of the timelines and how we've and how we've handled that. So any tweaks that need to be made, we'll go ahead and do that. Make sure that those roles are clearly defined and communicated. Um, there is a little bit more training that needs to be done with the Title IX designated officers. So even though we've had some training in the past, we are required to train and then document that training. Um, and we do have a number of hours that we have to perform in a year in order to keep that Title IX coordinator designation and create systems um, for records and gathering relevant data. So uh, definitely a lot of compliance as it relates to um, uh, those records. And then just the development of the protocols and compliance structure um, uh, and not necessarily the development, but just to make sure that what we're currently doing um, is supporting the, the new law, the changes in the law. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Jack? So going back to the comment up there that talked about emergency removal as a high bar, can you, uh, so two thoughts. One is uh, why did they want to make it more difficult and what would be an example of a high bar for removing somebody from a room when, when there's, uh, and I'll just use the phrase uncomfortable relationships in there. So it's my understanding, although I haven't researched this fully, but it's my understanding that there was a certain um, group of uh, folks that thought that the previous Title IX was a little bit too um, bent towards the victim and that the person that, um, that had the allegations bring, brought forward on them um, that they didn't necessarily have any rights and so, or as many rights as they should have. And so they made it a lot more neutral. Uh, and in that case, that was one thing that we talked about, Jack, is when you've got a situation to where, you know, you've got uh, some sexual harassment going on in the, in the classroom or something like that, that emergency re uh, removal is going to be extremely difficult to define until uh, we get into this a little bit more, but it could possibly be if there was a physical, let's say someone was raped. Um, I think that we would have to have some pretty extreme uh, cases in order to do that. The other thing to keep in mind is that these these investigations, we don't we don't drag them out for weeks and weeks and weeks. Whenever we get something like this, this is our number one priority and we move through it as quickly as possible. And this will also be another motivator to do that. Thank you. Tracy, this is Lance. How often, how often do you have to deal with this? From a student perspective, um, I don't know if Bryce or, my, or Mark are in the room or Micah or Kelly could speak to that. From a staff perspective, since my career here, um, I've had five, um, I've had five situations that could be classified under this law. Micah, do you have a sense for students? Not very often. You know, it does happen um, in the, the the level of the allegation and what it is. is was it name calling? Was it something like that? Um, 
I think some, sometimes there's challenges when it comes to conduct outside of school and off school grounds, and where does the the where does the school sit when it comes to that um, can be a challenge for us. But any other questions for Will? Uh, I was just wondering. So we already have the position of the Title IX coordinator, Bill. Now, who decides who the investigator or the decision maker? Well, I, I think if you were to look at it from a high school level, you have uh, a building level coordinator. Um, so that would be Mark Dennehy. The investigator could be one of the other assistant principals and the decision maker could be the principal. Um, if it was a staff to staff type thing, it might be Tracy at the district level would handle that because it's a personnel, uh, falls into that realm of personnel. Um, she could be, she can be, you, Tracy, correct me, you, you can be the coordinator and the investigator, but you cannot be the decision maker? Correct, as long as there's not a considered um, a conflict of interest. So then I would end up being probably the decision maker. On it, would, that. it would seem like the investigator would need some training. Or... Yeah, and, and I would say there that are, generally. There, ahead, are, there are training, so we will be um, training all of those roles. Um, so you'll have a cadre so, of folks who can right. serve. Right. However, the yeah, the coordinators are the ones that are primarily responsible for the process, and so there's a lot more training involved with those roles. But yeah, the investigator, we would not put anybody under this. And I would have to say that I, I think that most of our principals and assistant principals have had experience in investigations. So, um, but we would not put somebody who did not know how to, how to do this um, in the middle of that. Thank you, Tracy. Yep. Any other questions? Tracy, this is Rebecca Linden. Um, is the, you keep saying the new law, is this a state law or a federal law? It's a federal law. Title IX is under the federal law. So is this a cl clarification or a new law passed? It's an updated on the, on the initial law that was implemented. Thank you. Lynn Ryder you. had a question. Can you see that question, Lance? Uh, there you are. Why is the board not the decision maker? Just clarification, please. I, I, I would have to refer to the attorney, but it's my understanding is that we want to keep them in a neutral position just in case further uh, recourse comes along. And so you want to you want to keep the board out of that for as long as they can. The district would be making the decision and then um, if the person uh, wanted to appeal it, then they would appeal it to the board. If they didn't have that ability to appeal it to the board, then um, I think we're cutting out a cutting out a step there. Thank you. All right. Um, so that's the second reading. Any any concerns, trustees, about what what you read for the second readings on the policies? We do have one more reading. Um, if uh, you review them in between now and then, please let Micah know so we can address those concerns. Um, COVID update, Mr. Hill. All right, so bear with me because we're changing presenters and I can share. Okay, I'll share that. So you, they can see it. And while they're working on the technology, when we get to the new business and there's action items, uh, Beth, it, it would help Beth if you could say, state your name, whoever makes the motion, whoever seconds it. She's trying to take notes. Oh. Check. Can I just do this? Then I can. Yeah, okay. Yep. But now I cannot see where am I? 
I got to pull up some documents here. Um, all right, COVID update. Um, I can go full screen on that, but I'm going to pull this one up first. Can my audience see that okay? A little bit bigger, please. That's good. All right. So we have been tracking uh, the number of positive cases from the county along with the number of tests given uh, and then kind of correlated that to uh, what is going on in our district. And so uh, going back with the county data, um, I can request that and I get that from the county health department so I can actually see all the county's data. It's a wonderfully long spreadsheet. Um, and we're able to get the information from there. So back in September 6th, the week of September 6th, the total tests in the county given were 1,423. There were 133 positives. Glacier High School had one, Flathead had four, KMS in the elementary and Linderman were at zero. And so we had a total of five for the district. And so what we did is we pulled that information down into this graph. And this is the blue line represents what, I'll blow that up a little bit more. The blue line represents the number of positive cases in the, in the county. And the red line is the positive cases within school district five. Mm -hmm. So the county, this up, and this was up till uh, today, 424 positive cases um, and and that was in that week. That was in a one-week span, uh, and there were 15 in the district. And that would be a combination of students and, and employees. Yeah, that, that. Yep, that's everybody um, in the district. And then the other thing that we're doing, if you go to our website, there's a uh, there's two documents on there. If you, you click the data link on the website, um, it shows the uh, current active cases for the district and the year-to-date cases for the district and the quarantines active and the quarantines year-to-date. Um, and then we're reporting that out as a district, but then it's broken out by each school as well. Um, we just felt like, uh, you know, in our, you know when, the, when we got our first cases, we we're sending letters out. There's a lot of anxiety um, in our community about what's happening in the county and in our community and how that translates to what's happening within our schools. And we thought that this was a, a good way to, one, be transparent about what's going on, uh, and two, to communicate, you know, the things that we're doing are, are working. Um, you know, when I talk with Tamalee, and, and obviously our principals who are also talking with Tamalee on a regular basis, um, one of, the, one of the things that we would be concerned about is if someone tests positive and then the quarantines also converted to positive. And that's where, and that's where you would see spread within a school. And we're not seeing that. Um, and so while the county's numbers look bad, and I, I've certainly received emails from concerned community members and parents who said, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe the school's open. Look at what's happening in the county. You know, the hospital's full, the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of concern out there. And, uh, but what I can come back to is, yes, there is this going on, but then there's also something different going on within our schools. We've said, we know that we're gonna have cases. Um, and yeah, I think you heard a little bit from Trig today that, you know, there was a time when I felt like I was just hanging on by my fingernails, like, oh my gosh, am I gonna have to close the schools down? What, what are we gonna do? Um, you know, but I also I also touch base with all of our building administrators and, hey, where are you at? How are things? Our sub pool is way up. Um, we're we're getting almost all of our positions covered. Um, I think yesterday we had five para positions that weren't covered, um, which was really good for a Monday. And uh, you know, so we're 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 doing okay. But there's definitely an ebb and flow to this. When one school gets hit pretty hard with uh, positive cases and or quarantined. It feels real like the weight of the world is on you um, and trying to figure out how am I going to manage this and you know if I have to pull paras off of what they would normally be doing and supporting students to cover a teacher in a classroom or to cover food service or to cover the playground or to cover you know there's just a lot of, of movements and, and shuffling in there so any questions about the 
the data. Let's go with Will first. <laughs> Jack is lost. So, so uh, in covering, uh, do you pull like errors from another school and put them in this school, or is the earth, each school kind of an isolated? So, I'm not. I don't know if I understood the question. Well, you just mentioned that you had five paras mm -hmm. short on Monday. Yeah. My thought was if they're all from one school and you've got extra paras in this other school, maybe they go over. Does that not happen? No, and I, I think I think it would be really challenging to do that. Um, you know, and and when I say that there's you know five paras and we're covered, that doesn't mean that we didn't have paras in other buildings covering, and that's what left that that position open. Then the other thing is, uh, are we training the students when they're quarantined that uh, they just stay in their home and it's not like, well, you're not in school, but you can go out to wherever. Because this looks to me like the students when they're quarantining are staying at home and they're not exposing themselves in other, in the county general uh, venue. Um, so I'm wondering, if, is that a, a, a distinct training that's happening or is it just- Not on problem? the part of the school because the county is the one that's been making those contacts and saying, here's what you need to do. Huh? Um, and they're entered into a system and there's, there's, uh, there's checks on, on that part of it. But, you know, if, if Jack got quarantined and he decided he was going to the grocery store, there wouldn't be a whole lot we could do to, to stop or prevent that. Are you saying I do that? No, I'm not <laughs> saying you do that, Jack. I just. <laughs> Jack, did you have a question? I don't know if it's a question as much as it is, how do we get parents to understand the facts versus the emotions when you look at something like this? And, and how much are, are parents not willing to even listen to what the facts are. What have you been experiencing with that? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> they don't want to listen. Okay. No, that no, I, I think they do, and I, I think for some of them, this is when they see this. This is very reassuring for a lot of them. Um, I think if if we weren't being transparent and we and it looked like we were trying to minimize what's going on. I think that would cause greater concern and alarm um, for our parents. But, you know, I, I, the fear is out there. Um, and it's, I don't know if anything I'm going to say is necessarily going to change someone's mind. Um, so, yes, this is being very transparent because other school districts in Montana are not even going this route here. Have you been getting any feedback from them? Well, I, I can tell you that I, once we created, and I should say we, Bill Sullivan. <laughs> once Bill Sullivan uh, created these, I shared them with our uh, partner districts in Columbia Falls, Big Fork, and most of them are doing the exact same thing. They're, they're, they're sharing it as well. And, and there's certainly a call for that. You know, one of the things that did come up, I had a, a parent ask if we could do it every day. And, and the, the response to that was no. And it's not, it takes a, an awful lot of time. There are independent spreadsheets at every school site where they're putting this information in. We're going out and collecting it. You're relying on the county health department to get that information. The weekends are really tough, um, you know, so you don't get all of that, that information back or entered um, until the following Monday. So our process has been to gather it all on Wednesday, and posted it back to the website on Thursday. I sent out emails the first two times, um, and in my last communication, I said, this is where that information will be. No, so I'm not overloading an inbox. <laughs> well, no, and I think that's the right way to do it, because I hope everybody realizes that even whether you're talking about county data or state data, that there's a big delay in all that also, and that it's not accurate to the past 24, 48, or 72 hours. Yeah. Yeah, the, the health departments are just overwhelmed with, you know, one, they're trying to get the contact tracing done, so their focus is not on making sure everybody knows how many uh, positive cases are. Micah, have you 
had further discussions about what kind of metrics it would look like to shut down the school? Yes. Um, we have this discussion once a month with our COVID advisory council, which includes the health department, includes the hospital, uh, includes a epidemiologist who's also a parent, uh, and uh, the area administrators, there's a representative group. Um, and, you know, and we've said, like, what are the metrics? We've looked at what other states have done. We have looked at uh, what other cities and towns have done. And they certainly have metrics. Um, the, the hard part is most of their metrics are based on what's happening within a county um, and looking at positivity rates and not necessarily looking at these. And, you know, on this, if, if I had said, hey, if we got to, you know, on September 13th, we had 26, if we got one more case, we're closing. <laughs> That's a, it's really hard to put a finite number on that. And it's more of a, what's really going on within a school? Are we, are we doing everything that we can? Um, you know, to, to keep our schools open. And, uh, you know, I would argue that, that we are doing everything that we can from a school system uh, to be able to do that. But it's made it really hard. Um, the, the recent conversation is that this is a slow burn. Um, you know, we know that masks by themselves are not gonna necessarily prevent you from getting COVID. Um, but, it is going to slow the transmission. And when you take 6,000, 7,000 people and you put them indoors, in classrooms, uh, interacting, in activities, doing all of these things, and you look at what's going on with our data compared to the county data, I would say that what we're doing is working. I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are others who would argue against that. Are you saying parents might be able to learn something from students? <laughs> 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 Always learning. Jack, we're always learning. Okay. Other questions? Questions about that part of our our data? No, I sure appreciate it, uh, being able to have this information. Yes, and thank Bill Sullivan. He's the guy that uh, puts it all together for me every week, and um, it, it takes a lot of work. I think the other uh, piece that I would want to talk with the board about is, and, and Trig kind of segued into this um, is a discussion around our, our teachers and our staff. Um, been very, very challenging at times. And, it, and it's in pockets. I, I, I can't say that it's everywhere, but there is certainly an added layer of uh, expectation. You know, it, so I'm a teacher, I'm in the classroom, I'm teaching my kids who are in class. I've also got this group of kids who are out in quarantine or sick or whatever, you know, for whatever reason. But then I'm also, I'm pitching in. I'm, I'm giving up my, my prep period to go cover a class. Um, and, you know, so when all of those things in its totality add up, it's like, okay, when do I have time to prep to do, you know, to take care of those kids, to make sure that grades are being entered, parents are keep being kept informed, um, all of those things. And, uh, I've talked with all of our building principals um, uh, in varying degrees and just to get some feedback on maybe some thoughts and, and ideas. Um, certainly some of the ones that you heard uh, tonight from the middle school, you know, could we go to a four-day week? Could we, uh, you know, look at um, early releases on Wednesday? Um, I certainly have opinions on that. Um, and I know we got some feedback from the KEA. Uh, they sent out a survey, you know, just asking their staff, you know, what's going on? What, what's it feel like for you? Um, and I, I got it like an hour before uh, the meeting. So, and I think you guys got it too. Um, but I think it's worth the conversation. Um, my, on first blush, I do not see going to a four day week as being a, a really viable option if we're saying that kids are gonna be remote learning that day as well, because now you've added on this, I'm doing this in-person instruction, but now I have to prep every week for a lesson for uh, kids to be remote. I think there's also some challenges, you know, talking with uh, our AA counterparts um, and their hybrid models and, and things like that and how that's working and the, the feedback that they get from their community, you know, how hard it is as a parent who has to work but also, you know, take time off to be at home when they have to supervise their kids. Um, I, I just think there's some challenges, but certainly worth the discussion. Um, 
the early release uh, every Wednesday to allow for two more hours of uh, prep and uh, time to respond to the emails to take care of the kids who are um, uh, in quarantine. You know, that at, on any given day, the middle school, their average attendance rate is about 80%. So 20%, one in every five kids is absent. Um, that's a lot of kids. Uh, when you when you start doing the math on that, and there's some downsides to, to early releases to any kind, anything that really shortens the instructional time for students. Um, you know, there's there's a curriculum to get through. There are standards to be met. There are we're prepping for tests. We're trying to give our kids a leg up uh, in IB and AP. Um, you know, so there's there's some trade-offs with that. And uh, I don't know, I'd like to. Here are the board's thoughts on that. Well, I think, at least for myself, it's definitely we want to be able to support the teachers in this very stressful and trying time. You know, we recognize that teachers put in more than their share, fair share of work just on a, a regular year, let alone with this on top. So, uh, personally, I would be very uh, supportive of any initiative going forward, whether it be a full day off or uh, early releases on a regular basis. You know, and I don't know if this should be vetted through uh, maybe a personnel committee first and then finance, or um, if we just want to come straight to the board and have the bigger conversation. Um, any other trustee you want to weigh in on their thoughts on this? Well, I just have a question. Were all the teachers really, I mean, were they asked about what they thought and did they have any ideas? I guess I wasn't clear on that. Was that really, did the teachers bring in all their input of what they would like to see happen to make this easier? On them? Um, like, I haven't been able to get through oh. all of that. There are some general questions around, uh, you know, how much more time are you having to put in? Um, you know, and, and, it, and it's hit and miss. Uh, talked to a social studies teacher yesterday. He said, you know, I had like two kids gone on quarantine, but the teacher right next door had 18. Um, you know, so what that looks like. And, and I don't know, I, Michelle and, and Vicki are here. I don't know if you have any. Uh, insight into into that question, <laughs> or not? <laughs> well, I think it depends upon each individual teacher's um, outlook on it, what they're able to do with the students. Because a lot of times, if I get a rest of the students in quarantine, but we have teachers that are able to teach remotely and be present, and others aren't able to, so it's very Oh, thank you. Sorry. It's very unique to each circumstance as to the teacher's skills and ability and then the ability of the students as well. Yeah, and I would just add, um, you know, I think simple is better. Simpler is better. That has been our mantra, you know, opening up five days a week, all in person. Um, you know, I have appreciated that so, so much, and many of my staff have kids, they have littles, they have elementary age kids, and some have high school age kids, and it is hard. It is so hard to add that layer on of having to juggle the schedules. You know, when, you're, when your kids go to school in a district that has the blended model, right, or your kids go to Whitefish, and then Whitefish just shut down, right, and so, you know, I had a teacher come to me yesterday, oh my gosh, okay, so I'm going to have to be out tomorrow because they just shut down Whitefish, and I, we got to figure this out, and um, so for me, I, you know, keeping it simple has been critical, and, um, you know, teachers are just, they're doing the best that they can, but the added burdens just there are a lot, there are a lot. And I think, you know, us going to a four day week or even with the early release on the Wednesday, that's gonna add, it's gonna take away, right, some of the stressors, but it's really gonna add more for a lot of our staff. So it's a complicated question. I mean, you, it is just not an easy. Well, I knew it wasn't gonna be an easy question to answer, but I consider what, there is no really no easy solution. I mean, Right. Yeah. I mean, we're doing the right things, KEA, right? They're asking their membership, right? And that's being shared with the district admin. I mean, so voices are being heard, and we just have to trust that that's going to lead us down the right path. Thank you. 
Scott? And I think we should get a few personnel so um, we get a chance for Mike to, to digest the uh, survey that was set out and then really bring a recommendation. Because him and his staff, I think, will have here in the very near future have a good idea of what would work best for teachers in the district for um, some type of recommendation for us. So I think it should be vetted to personnel personally. There's a lot of information. I just started reading through this. And it'd yeah. be good to try and digest that. Yeah, to get your recommendations. Does that work, Micah? Yeah, we can. Well, we can bring it to personnel and and have that larger discussion. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then, go ahead, Scott. One last thing, um, and I, I think we talked about it at our last personnel committee or finance is if you could bring numbers for the added comp time hours um, teachers are putting in, just so we have just just a number. It may be last year's numbers too. Yeah. Well, it's kind of piggybacking on what Scott just said. It seems like our main concern would be burnout, staff burnout. And uh, we kind of behoove us to get some sort of a metric where we can kind of keep track of, to try to catch it before it happens. What, you know, I don't know what that would look like, but um, if you could keep somebody from burning out, that's a win for us. Point well. Further comments or questions? All right, more to come. There was one from Lynn. I saw it. Yeah, and I think Lynn could share that at the personnel committee. A little bit more in depth on those conversations. Okay. When is the, the next personnel committee? You're not invited. Thanks. <laughs> first, should, be, should be the first Wednesday of the month. Yep. Okay. Is that too far out? If you want to schedule uh, one earlier, we certainly can. Mike, I'll let you take the lead on that and just kind of let us know. Yep, I will. Jack, uh, you covered it. All right. All right. Let me update. Let me update. Um, so since we started promoting the levy a week ago, um, we have distributed yard signs to all our schools, encouraged our staff to uh, place them out. Uh, I've done some interviews with KGZ. Uh, Gwen uh, was interviewed with Daily Interlake. Um, Jack was interviewed by NBC Montana. And I thought for sure, Jack, that you were gonna say that you saw the story about produce in schools on our Facebook page because <laughs> I looked and I we posted it. it. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I guess I don't know how to navigate it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'll teach you. Um, had some community conversations. Uh, I, I did go to the Pachyderm Club uh, last week with Scott and uh, did not even get a chance to talk about uh, the levy. Um, it was a it was good, um, <laughs> and I've talked with the Kalispell Education Foundation, have sent uh, an email to all KPS families uh, with the virtual uh, flyer, virtual mailer. Uh, our partner districts basically sent the same thing, but addressed it to our KPS partner district families, um, asked those to be uh, shared. Uh, the KPS website uh, has a lot of information. It has the FAQ, has, um, uh, you know, notable achievements and awards for our, our high school district um, has uh, a lot of information about the need, what what it pays for, um, you know, far more detailed information. Um, probably the biggest thing that we've done, though, is uh, with social media. And um, I want to point out Stephanie Hill sitting here in our audience. Um, Stephanie actually uh, helps run our KPS social media page um, and is very dialed into the analytics and the reach and how much things are being shared and viewed. Um, 
we it it's been incredible. She knows exactly, Micah. You got to post whatever you're going to post at seven o'clock p.m. That's when it's going to get the most views and shares and likes and, and those kind of things. If I post it at one o'clock on a Tuesday, nobody's going to see it. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff there, and so just want to acknowledge um, Stephanie for her help um, with this. Uh, been very instrumental, and so thank you, Stephanie. Of coverage, we're continuing to pull that in and, and continue to share that out um, through this venue. Um, you know, I, I think interestingly, um, you know, 77% of our reach is engaging new people, so people who do not like Kalispell Public Schools, and not, I don't mean that like on Facebook, they do not like Kalispell Public Schools, um, and so the information is being disseminated um, and pushed out, and we will continue to do that. There is some danger in overposting. Um, you know, I could certainly put something out all the time, uh, but what happens is, and it's a KPS page, so we're not just posting levy information, we're posting uh, updates about our schools. There, Stephanie's doing these school spotlights where she goes out to each of the schools. She interviews Michelle and Flathead High School was just recently uh, wonderful, BOAG, uh, LEC, and then uh, uh, Glacier High School are, are next up on that. And so uh, things are, are, are looking good on that. Um, yeah, yeah. so see Jack, his uh, interview with NBC Montana will post on Wednesday. Um, and uh, I asked Wes uh, to look at our metrics um, analytics on our webpage and how many views that was getting. Um, so far we've had 119 uh, views of our levy information on our website, which um, is low, I, I think, you know, for for the information that we're putting out. I don't know if it's just people don't care or they don't need any more information, um, but I think it's also important that that information is there because there's a layer of transparency in what the need was. It has the board minutes. It has uh, all sorts of information on there for, for people to go in and see. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're working on it and, uh, and Hopefully, it will be successful. Well, I know the ballots are out and, <coughs> and uh, voted yesterday. Well, I was going to make a comment on that. Yes. Um, so I did go with uh, Mike to the Pachyderm Club, and um, he did an amazing job. Um, all these events he's being asked to speak at, not everybody at them is uh, an advocate of Hustle School and ask him very difficult questions. And he does just a great job of explaining the district's stance and um, remaining very neutral, but giving the point across of what he has to do to keep kids in school, keep uh, staff safe, and the laws that he needs to follow. I just wanted to let the board know that he is out there all the time talking to the different organizations that ask him to speak. He doesn't shy away from any of them and uh, just does a phenomenal job and doesn't try and sidestep any questions um, and just answers them the best he can and just does a great job with it. So thank you, Micah, for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Scott, thank you for attending. Um, I think in the future, I encourage Micah to reach out to us in advance so trustees can accompany him, uh, just to be there supportive. You know, I remember uh, someone at the chamber once told me, if the trustees can't make it to these presentations, why should I vote? You know, if we're not going to support it, why why would he? So uh, hopefully we can be there. Um, yeah, let's do it. And it, it is nice for. Mike, to have that, just that extra support to, for us to 
be nodding along with what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least one friendly face. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then leave right before all the hard questions, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, new business. All right. I'm going to stop sharing, and Callie, I'll let you go back to. And this is where when we make a motion, please state your name too, so Beth can get that for the record. And I need to quit air team. And you can just pull up the agreement. That's right at the top there. <laughs> um, hey, can I just, this is Ursula, can I just ask a quick question? Um, Amy yep. lost her internet in Creston because of the storm, and she's wondering if she can still vote by texting to somebody or through me. Um, is that something she can hear? So you can just answer her. Okay, Amy, you should be able to vote. Um, so, okay. you want her Apparently to, te to text somebody? So yeah, so she doesn't. She 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 can only hear is where she's at. Okay. Well, we we can't really use a proxy. We've got to get the information directly from her in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Not not right. through a proxy. She was wondering if she could text somebody that was there her vote. Um, Good question. I, I'm going to say no, because it's got to go directly to, I'll say the board chair anyways, via what would be a normal access route for any of the other trustees. Yeah. And I don't have a phone. So, um, No, no, no. She's, she's wondering if there's a, a different number she could call where she could speak she, instead of yeah. just here. Well, she can hear, but she can't apparently can't speak. Because she's maybe Amy, just because Amy. she's not a um, she doesn't have like administrative um, access. She, she has the access. If she's on a phone, she should be able to speak. She's unmuted. Yeah, Jason says she's unmuted, so she should be able to talk. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Is that you, Amy? I can hear you, Amy. Is that yeah. it? <laughs> well, I tried. Right. I tried. I tried to. Um, I asked that question a couple times, and you didn't hear me, so I just assumed you couldn't. But awesome. Okay, never right. mind. Sorry for that um, for that delay when you could hear me. Right. We're back on track. <clears throat> All so right, thank you so much. Deputy Health Officer Agreement. So this uh, came to, I'm bringing this forward for possible action, um, and certainly uh, the board can decide if, if they want to make a motion. Um, this started in Billings uh, where the schools were being asked to uh, assist in contact tracing. Um, right now in, in Kalispell and in our county, uh, the principal gets a call, a student and or staff member has tested positive, we need all the seating charts, we need all the information, um, the principal has to go in, verify attendance, go through the seating charts, they all get sent to the county health department, County Health Department sends a list back. Here's all the kids that, that we are going to quarantine. And then we send them a uh, names and contact information for that, uh, for that student and for those students who are gonna be placed on quarantine. Um, in, in what we're doing, the only step that's really missing in that contact tracing is the phone call uh, in notifying parents and, and families. Um, I talked to Greg Upham, who's the superintendent at Billings uh, at length, um, when he initially did this, um, and I've talked to him uh, a couple of times since, and what are the pros and cons, what, what's going on with this, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, essentially, they, they had a contract that was drawn up. Uh, it went through their legal counsel, 
um, and then also went through their county's legal counsel, and they came up with this agreement uh, that would basically deputize administrators um, in their district and their nurses uh, to assist in the contact tracing. Um, the being deputized uh, has has a couple of components to it. One is it allows the health department to identify who was the positive case, um, and then it also uh, indemnifies the the employee of the district from any kind of litigation or anything like that. If someone were to say, you know, well, you didn't, you know, you missed me. I should have been a contact, and I got sick, and you know, it, there is the potential that that, that could happen. Um, I talked with our, our administrators, um, and there were some mixed feelings on it. Uh, you know, certainly ones are like, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing 90% of it. I just, uh, you know, if I have to call, you know, seven families or whatever, not a big deal. Um, but then there are others who have said, I'm already putting in four hours <laughs> on this contact tracing. And if I have to make the phone calls, that's more time. Um, when I talked to Greg last, he said one of the things that they didn't anticipate was the response from parents who were upset that their kid was being quarantined. Uh, and, you know, there were some challenges with that, um, just in the sense that we're trying to build relationships, uh, not, uh, not tear them down. And so, uh, Tamalee Robinson uh, approached the Northwest Mass Group, the area superintendents, and asked if, if there was any interest in this. Um, most of us said, yeah, there's some interest in this, but we want to see a, an agreement. And so this agreement went through the uh, uh, Flathead County uh, Attorney's Office um, and has gone through their legal review. Um, and it pretty much mirrors what uh, Billings uh, looks like as well. It's just for Flathead County. and. Um, I, I think if this were to uh, be approved, there would be a couple of caveats to it. One, um, if an administrator did not feel comfortable doing this, I wouldn't ask them to do it. I, I, I think it's a, at this point it would be a personal choice um, in, in whether or not they wanted that. Um, the, the nurses, so for example, we had a nurse uh, that was quarantined, um, could be making these calls. And in, in, so, in some cases, I think, Hearing from a nurse, from a medical professional, as opposed to a school administrator, uh, could also be uh, a better avenue um, in this. It would require training, um, where we could do it in a Zoom meeting um, and and get the the lowdown on the contact tracing. This is not case investigation, so I'm not, you know, if Lance were the person that was a, a positive. I would not be calling Lance to say, okay, who'd you spend the weekend with? What, what bars and restaurants were you at? Where? It wouldn't be that. It's just basically working through anybody who's associated with the school and identifying who those close contacts are. Mike, at this point, there's no cost associated with this. No. And it kind of reflects maybe some of the work that's already being done? A lot of the work that's already being done. So if the final step is just making the phone call saying, because uh, they already know they tested, so it's just identifying the ones that are quarantined, notification, because all the work's been done. Uh, instead of the being building administrators, do we have a, uh, can it be directed by the, the nurses that we have, or is there a way to um, address it that way? given what the comments you just made. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly a, a possibility. And I think I think our nurses, I haven't talked to the nurses specifically, but I think they have expressed that they're, uh, that they would be interested in helping with that and, and see it as part of their uh, responsibilities within the district to serve our, our students and families. Well, is this something we'd have to run through KEA? No, this because this would just be our administrative staff. Um, so I don't, I don't think they would need to go through. Um, the community. nurses aren't part of. Um, well, they are. Uh, would it be considered a change of duties? 
I don't know. Well, what it means is they work during the day. I mean, a lot of these calls are made 8 o'clock at night or on the weekends, right? Because they try to get all the contacts notified prior to the next school day. Yeah. So it's kind of an evening job or a weekend job. Yeah, it could be. And, and part of it is the, um, you know, it would be more of an assistance to the county health department. They are struggling with the contact tracers, and we have certainly heard about staff who have tested and you know haven't been called, haven't been called. Um, the students are easy to pick out because of the age, um, and the, yeah, I mean I, I think there's just some some things that we would have to necessarily work through uh, to do this. Uh, Lynn Ryder notes that it's not a KEA, KEA issue as long as there is not extra con. Contract hours. This is not an issue. For what it's worth. Um, this is Ursula. I have a question. Yeah, Ursula. Um, I'm wondering. I'm wondering with the contract tracing, does it have to be an administrator that does it because of privacy issues? It, well, no, not necessarily. I think it's just that the administrators in the building know. You know, I'll use Michelle as an example. She keeps a binder of every single case that she's had to go through. She knows this, the arrangements in the classroom, who should, who should be identified as a close contact based on the information that she has. Um, I think the building administrators are the ones to best answer those questions as opposed to let's just hire someone or use a nurse that isn't necessarily in the building to uh, assist with that type of, um, with that component of it. Okay, because my, my next part of that kind of goes to you know, talking about that burnout and the amount that everybody is doing um, as this looks like a kind of a whole job of its own. The contact tracing becomes an entire job of its own. And I know you said that the way that it's presented, there's no financial implication, but I wonder if there actually is the time in a day, the energy in a day for somebody who already has a complete job to be doing this. Um, you know, I, I, I just think we should be open to the possibility that it might have a financial implication in order to keep everybody able to do the other jobs that they need to do. That's a fair point, Ursula. Can I speak my experience with this? Yes, please. So, um, this is Vicki Buck. Yes, Vicki Buck. Two weeks ago, I can't quite hear her. I'm sorry. Can you make sure she has a mic? So, this is Vicki Buck. Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to work with Tamalee for the first time at Russell because we had a student test positive. And when, by the time she contacted me to get the contact tracing and the seating charts from Russell, it was well into the evening, about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And so by the time we worked through the seating charts to see who was primary contact, she then gave me the option when she called them the next day, the parents, to notify them that their students were primary contacts, if the parents would then come during the middle of the day and take the students home or wait until the end of the school day. And I was very honest with her and I told her that I didn't like either of those options, that if they were primary contacts then they shouldn't even be coming to school that day. But she said because she had so many phone calls to place that night, she was not going to be able to contact the parents of Russell. However, she gave me the option if I wanted to contact the parents, notify the students and let them know that they'd be contacted by the health department the next day that I could do that. And so then I took the next two hours that evening to contact the parents and only one parent was upset, but I had really good conversation with the parents. And I like this as an administrator because it gives you the option if you have that time and availability then to help out the county health department. Not that it's mandatory that we do that, but if we have the avail availability to assist, we can. Because I didn't feel comfortable having those students come to school the next day and then leave in the middle of the day or leave at the end of the school day if they were primary contacts and shouldn't have been there just because they were overwhelmed at the county health department. 
and really the conversations that I had with the parents was very beneficial. And each, each conversation ranged anywhere from five to 20 minutes, but I was able to answer some of the fears and the upset about them missing school and what that's going to look like for their students and what we can do at the school for that. So as an administrator, I just like this idea knowing that if we have time and availability to assist, we can. Not that it's an absolute requirement for us. To reach deputized at that moment, so to speak? No. No, I wasn't. And this was two weeks ago. I think this was prior to those conversations being had. And she followed up with every single parent the next day, and she had the conversation. But she also gave me a very explicit script of what I was allowed to say and what I couldn't say, which was very beneficial. But this was prior to the conversations we had at the administration level of being deputized. I think another uh, factor in this, and you know, if I'm a building principal and I, I have one a week, maybe, you know, some of our, our schools have had very few cases versus, say, Michelle, who, <laughs> yep, <exactly>. you know, <laughs> when you get 10 of them, and, you know, and is that the expectation, um, you know, and, and ultimately it is the county health department's responsibility. And if, if you know, look, I can't call parents at, at 9 o'clock tonight, I just, you know, you're going to have to do that. I, I mean, I think there's the, the latitude. There's nothing in this that says that we have to do it. But I think if administrators want that option and, and uh, want to be able to do that and they see it as a, a community service, I, I don't have a problem with it. So, Mike, are we all set? I mean, if we were to approve this, uh, you could run with it? Well, we'd still have to set up a training with the county health department um, and, and, make, and get the agreement signed. And um, I've asked for a badge. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get one, but <laughs> I was told no guns. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we could, we could make it happen. It may not happen, you know, in the next, you know, by the end of this week, but we could certainly start laying the, the groundwork and, and to be able to get going on it. I'd love to see our nurses involved in this. We purposely tried to get um, what, additional nurses support this year with some of our COVID funds. I'd love to see how we could have them help. So is there a trustee who'd be willing to make a motion to, to approve this? Um, I have one more question first, Lance, if that's okay. This is Rebecca. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, you know, like Ursula and Micah pointed to, there is some issues of, does this feel like it's an additional duty without recompense? Um, but beyond that, there's also, a concern that it feels it might feel to a parent more like it's coming from the school if it's a person associated with the school who's calling them the health department. Um, so I definitely think it needs to be optional, but I think we do need to at least consider and be careful about that this is not the school saying you're in quarantine and and I wouldn't want any confusion to happen about how that's perceived. Fair point. Fair point. Is there a trustee who'd be willing to make a motion on this? I'll move that we uh, approve the proposal as presented. That's Will Hyatt making the motion. Is there a second? Second. Amy, second. Second. Oh, Kim Wilson beats you, Amy. So Kim Wilson made second. Okay. Further discussion? Uh, I have some discussion. So we, we've heard that. Uh, Teachers are spending extra time, and we've heard that administrators have been spending extra time and will uh, spend extra time. And the concern is the financial considerations mm -hmm. in both cases, and uh, we don't know how to address it in either one of them. So I'm wondering if the, the, the motion, at least for this point in time, should include uh, no financial considerations for the extra time. I'm just going to throw that out on the table. I'm not trying to pick on administrators, not, but we don't have an, a real answer for uh, any anybody on how this is going to go and and how to compensate because we still have the struggle on on 
not that we won't be addressing all this later on, but I'm just wondering if, if there should, should be some uh, understanding or mention of that. I'm just throwing that one out. Because, and especially if, you know, if we're going to use nurses and when Lynn identified within the contract hours, to what degree does that need to be researched to understand the contract hours that they're doing and if they're going to be doing this in the evening, is that outside of their contract hours? And those are things that still may need, even though it may be real desirable to use the nurses, and I think that should, might be the best first choice. Um, we may need to have some other steps and, and we can pass the motion and then it's up to Micah to figure out how to implement it and he'll have the discretion because he won't be required and it'll be optional of people. But I don't know that, that we might use the word optional or discretion in the motion too. So I'm just thinking out loud on some of those aspects. Well, we've already, uh kind of designated the personnel committee to look at uh, fixing out of duties for our staff. This kind of falls under the same purview. And uh, we could ask the personnel committee to consider this as well because it is out of duties and it does increase the amount of time that somebody who's already full time and totally busy uh, it would work way better for those folks we have who aren't, whose day is totally full. Maybe that is the nurses, but I would think that the kind of consideration we're asking for should be done by the personnel committee. Okay. Further discussion? So we did make a motion. We've got a second to approve this. Um, so we'll call for a vote. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Ursula, how do you vote? Amy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Amy, hey, Lance, this is, Lance, this is Amy. Um, I guess we, um, I was interested in Jack's suggestion of maybe amending it, but we're not going to. Is it, we're no. basically, Jack mentioned we, that. So this, this motion. We would either need to back out the motion or vote it down. So I think we will probably have further discussion um, in the future at the Personnel Committee, um, maybe to clarify this, but at least this will get them started on um, being able to deputize the, the uh, administration as needed and as option, as option. Okay. Okay, then I'm I. Okay. Today vote nay. Motion passed unanimously. Uh, personnel action items. I move approval of the personnel action items. That was Jack Fallon. Scott seconds that. <laughs> Scott Warnhouse seconds that. <laughs> Further discussion. Uh, this is Rebecca Linden. Yeah, I had a question on the um, MOA. Um, as it was presented, it seemed like um, we'd taken out. We're not, quite a, we're not oh. at the MOA yet. We're still oh, sorry, personnel. I thought that was the personnel. Nope. Nope. Further discussion on the personnel action items? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Ursula? Aye. Amy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we're at the MOA. Sorry about that. I can't tell B from C, apparently. Um, no worries. Well, so let's, it, have the, let's have the presentation on it first before you ask questions. <laughs> I'm still here and excited, you know, at 829. By the way, Micah, Doug did say I got a gun, so I just wanted to let you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we did present this originally to the board, and we really feel that that process worked well, uh, we appreciate the fact that we were able to bounce this idea off of you. I think both the union and uh, the district feel really comfortable with where we ended up. The majority of this MOA is the same uh, as we initially presented. The only change that we made is that we took out the stipend language. We took it out altogether. And the reason for that is because it was a pretty big hang up 
uh, for something that is really a big if that it's even going to happen. So um, MHSA has really committed to trying to keep the students' activities going. There, uh, there may be delays in when those um, activities occur. For example, I, I believe Micah uh, wrestling was moved to the spring instead of um, being the winter sport. Um, but we really don't feel that there's a high probability that, um, that the activities will be canceled. So both parties agreed that we would just address that as it came up. Uh, with the assumption that really it's it's not as um, probable as the other issues on this. So that is the main change that we made in the MOA. And then um, as I put in the cover letter, I think it was 230 people supported this with the KEA and only five declined or did not support it, which is a really high ratio. And so uh, again, I always want to give a shout out uh, to the union. I think that um, we're really working well together and ex have an extremely collaborative process and uh, definitely makes my job look a lot better than the other double A's at this point in time. So any questions? Rebecca, you get the first one. Woo! Thanks, Lance and Casey. Um, so Tracy, we said we dropped out the activities and I was a little concerned about the language that says um, in mandatory school closures, we maintain all benefits. And I was checking to make sure that didn't include activities or put us into a situation we didn't want to be in. That does not include activities. Activities is a completely separate uh, uh, contract. Perfect. Just wanted to check. Thanks. Other questions for Tracy? Would uh, trustee be willing to make a motion to approve the MOA? I, uh, this is Scott. I'll make a motion. We approve the MOA as presented. Thank you. And this is Sue. I'll second that. Very good. Further discussion? All in favor? We'll start with Amy. Aye. Ursula? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Trustees present here? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for all your work on that. Uh, contracts. There's none on the elementary. Uh, district wide, though. District wide contracts. We've got an MOU, large learning, and e finance self hosting. Okay, um, the Sparrow's Nest, this is just formalizing uh, uh, existing relationships that the school district has with the Sparrow's Nest. This allows the two groups to exchange information and in an attempt to make certain that students' needs are met. And um, so this is just the first time we've actually formalized it in an MOU. And Sarah uh, brought that forward, uh, I think it and she has another commitment tonight. Huh? So, any questions? I, I do. I do okay. want because I'm new. How long has this been in effect? How, how long is this program? Is this brand new or Sparrow's Nest has been open for a couple of years, oh, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. And and we've been working. The school district has been working with Sparrow's Nest, but we haven't had a formal MOU. And Sarah just thought, well, both parties thought it was probably time to formalize our relationship. Because okay. I went on their website and it was—it sounds like a really good program, and, uh, and they only take eight students. I'm a little surprised by that, even though it's so a little. But I was just curious how long it's been. Yeah. Thank you. There's also three other. There's also three other contracts on the next page too. There, American Electric, Advanced Roofing, and Rocky Mountain Supervac. So. Uh, Ursula, did you have a question? It was it was Amy. Sorry, Lance. Oh, Amy. Yeah, I would. Uh, Gwen V met. It's the first time we've had an agreement. I was just wondering if it was run by um, MTSDA or legal counsel. You know, I don't know if it was. I, I can't speak to that. Hey, Amy. I do remember that a uh, couple 
about every year we renew a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Flathead Youth Home, which is also a nonprofit that works with kids. Um, there's no financial connection here, uh, just an understanding that we'll work together. Okay. So I think that's kind of in that same vein. Okay, thanks. And we could probably do all these in one motion, so I'll go ahead and yeah. touch on the others. So the large learning a contract is actually uh, for Stillwater Christian School to offer tutoring to their students. So we have some non-public schools that access Title I dollars through Kalispell Public Schools, and then and they don't actually get a cash uh, outlay, but they can purchase services through Kalispell Public Schools through the Title I. And so that's what the large learning contract is for. And then the e-finance self-hosting has to do with the uh, e-finance is the business office and HR office software. And we've been uh, being hosted by PowerSchool. And we've had some real difficulties in, in being hosted by them, just latency and in transfer of data, uh, oftentimes any kind of uh, help, any kind of information that goes in is not really available back to us till the next day. Um, our, our system has been down repeatedly and we're thinking that we can uh, do a better job if we're hosting that ourselves and that's what we did with our previous uh, software. And after several discussions, uh, we've come around to agree that this is probably a really good idea. We need to purchase some hardware for the software to reside on in our district. And then there will be some cost in migrating the data. And the third option on this, and I probably should have done a separate, um, separate item, and that is that we've agreed that um, we will not purchase these enterprise management services to the tune of about $76,000 over a two-year period. That was to have uh, Power School do the updates, um, make sure our system was always up and running. Um, and they haven't necessarily done a great job of that with them hosting us, so we're not certain that we would be getting $76,000 worth of services. Um, and we think that we would be better served if we hired an additional IT person uh, for a couple of years and to focus on this, and then they would probably have more, um, more time available to do some other things in the IT department because this is really, or at least we don't think it would be a 40 hour a week job, um, but the, the learning curve could be fairly steep. So, uh, but we decided that our money might be better spent by adding an additional staff member to the ID, IT department. And I did not put that on this cover sheet because it seemed like it was two separate issues, one's a contract and the other is an additional FTE. So I'll bring it back around for the additional FTE at the next board meeting. So tonight we're just looking at the cost of the hardware and the migration of the data from their servers to ours. And this will be paid for out of uh, business office funds. And then Gwen, do you wanna keep rolling with the American Electric contract? And Advanced sure. roofing and so some construction contracts. American Electric will be installing the lights uh, upgrade in Flathead High School's auditorium. Um, the advanced roofing contracts will be for four sections of roof on Flathead High School. We've been through the bidding process for that, and they actually did some roofing for us at Flathead High School last spring, and these contracts are for next spring. This allows us to get on their schedules and them to order the materials that they need and be ready to go the minute school's out. And then the Rocky Mountain Supervac was some striping that was done in a couple of the Flathead High School parking areas. And so a total of six contracts, all district-wide. Yep. 
So the uh, uh, auditorium that was bond money, so that yes. already but that exists. Yes. The roofing is that is bond money also. Bond money also. And the Rocky Mountain Superback is bond money also. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering on these um, facilities contracts. Uh, our new guy, Mr. Naplin, had a look at these. Uh, no, these were all done prior to his his start, and like the the roofing contracts, I think that all happened when they did the initial bidding on on replacing some of the roofs, uh, like last winter, like in February or so. Yeah. And the American Electric, they've been working on for nearly a year. Uh, you may have remember seeing contracts to have someone design the lighting and to get experts to weigh in on what should actually happen and then go through the bidding process. And the Rocky Mountain Superback uh, striping is fairly straightforward and it's complete, so we don't necessarily need <laughs> Mr. So with the, Mr. Tim Schuldice, did he kind of oversee the uh, American, I guess the advanced roofing? The advanced roofing and the Rocky Mountain Superback and Bryce did all the legwork on that American Electric auditorium lighting. So there were some eyes on it. Right. Yeah. I move approval of the contracts as presented. Second. Diane. That was Jack making the motion and Diane doing the second. Uh, further discussion? Present trustees, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Ursula? Aye. Amy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Are there any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, donation acceptance. And so that is, it's actually two pronged um, donation. One is a cash uh, contribution to Flathead High School and the donor has asked to be re remain anonymous. And secondly, um, last winter, the Flathead High School Alumni and Friends Association wrote a check for $21,000 directly to Park Avenue as partial payment on the Steinway piano. Um, but we needed to have, we need to have formal action on that being a donation to the school district and it clarifies the ownership of the piano. Um, so two donations there totaling $41,237.19 and it mm -hmm. just needs to be recognized by the board. I move that we accept the donation proposal. Thank you for making that motion, Will. Second, Rebecca Linden. Rebecca Linden beat you to it, Kim. <laughs> As for the second. Further discussion? All in favor of accepting these donations, please say aye. 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 Amy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Ursula? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. Would someone care to make it? Scott, would you like to make a motion on that? I move we uh, approve the consent agenda as uh, presented. Thank you, Scott. I'll second. Thank you, Sue. Sue seconds it. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Ursula? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Amy? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries nearly unanimous. Jack's not here. <laughs> 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 Informational items and reports. Uh, Ursula, you want to kick us off? Do you have a trustee report? Um, so we had a curriculum meeting and um, our curriculum meeting a lot focused on just kind of understanding what curriculum is and how it works, um, the important things that we need to know. Uh, one of the big ones is what is curriculum? And it is the difference between what standards are and what curriculum is. And the big thing is standards are set by the Office of Public Instruction. And then curriculum is how the school district decides to implement those things. And so, just kind of understanding the differences between the government's job and the teacher's and administrator's job and the school board's jobs. 
Thank you, Ursula. Amy, do you have a report? I do not. Thank you. Rebecca? Thank you, Callie and Ursula, for running a great meeting. All right. Mark, do you have a trustee report? I do. I reviewed um, this lovely packet um, <laughs> that was offered to us. Uh, this OSHA sheet is for respirators. It is not for masks. If you need to be fitted with a respirator, you need to, that, that's your guideline there. <laughs> this, this is handy, but it really doesn't apply a whole lot um, to the situation because I do believe that masks uh, <laughs> prevent uh, non um, symptomatic people from spreading also. So, and then this one is, is really pretty funny. Um, it, there, was, there was a little tiny bit of data that was highlighted for me so I could find it easily that was uh, kind of misrepresented here. It's interesting, so if you want to go look through this, there is no abstract, it's not a study. This is just uh, some information based on a, a sample of uh, 300 some people. And it just so happened that six of, of uh, the patients and then five of the control participants never wore a mask, but the other people did. And, and it, I think this was misrepresented completely by a certain libertarian looking fellow from Kentucky. That's Thank, our Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Sue? Well, we had a uh, federal project committee meeting and talked about, uh, you know, the concern about recruiting um, support personnel, uh, school psychologists in particular. Uh, we still can't <clears throat> replace that position and are sending that out on contract. Um, but we've got a couple um, thoughts on that one, so hopefully that will uh, get solved soon. Uh, the other thing we talked about was the importance of our school nurses during this time. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It makes a whole lot of sense that we strengthen our nursing <coughs> staff and support them uh, the best we can. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I think you all got my email about the MTSBA Delegate Assembly, and as one of the um, larger districts, we get extra delegates. And so I, Diane, Lance, and Ursula um, will be um, one of the delegates to that, where we will meet on November 6th. And it is very timely because we're going to be talking about the results of the election as well as some of the new legislation um, coming up in this legislative session. So it could be an interesting discussion. No doubt it will be. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> Scott, do you have a report? I guess I kind of gave mine earlier about going to academic. It's a good job that the, uh, uh, our staff. Thank you. Diane? Uh, no, no it, it's handy to have all of these meeting minutes attached to this because I feel like I have been held meetings by reading it. I really appreciate it. It's a great update. Thank you. Kim? Nothing else. Will? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. I would say the boardsmanship uh, that is going on at the community college has been uh, refreshing. Went to it last year, but it's uh, yeah, it, it's just good to think about that bigger picture about why we're there. And, um, you know, I've been provided uh, uh, as trustees all of our duties uh, in this noted in the state statute. It's a it's an overwhelming number, but they're there. <laughs> they're there. Um, the other part I'd just say um, it's strange as a parent of a of a high school kid not to be in the school to see activities. Partially because of what my kids decide not to do, but uh, partially just because it's uh, not as available either. So, yeah. uh, Micah? 
Yes, uh, I think you've probably all heard, but uh, Russell Elementary School was selected as a blue ribbon school in Montana, one of only two and one of only 317 nationwide, which is uh, awesome for Bill and Vicki um, and that staff. Um, wanted to acknowledge it, but also know that we will have something more formal and invite the, the Russell staff to uh, to be acknowledged. There's some usually there's a, a ceremony, and but everything's being done virtually. And um, I didn't think it would be very appropriate just to make a little certificate um, <laughs> for such a momentous uh, occasion. So we do plan on trying to do something to honor that staff. Uh, for the work that they've done. Pretty amazing, pretty special. So has KPS ever had a blue ribbon school before? Yes. Elrod. Elrod. Has been a blue okay. ribbon school as well back in two thousand and eight. Okay. So we've got two. Yep. Which is okay. which is great. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> the only other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is uh the MHSA uh had an executive meeting on October 13th. The uh, minutes of that were sent out. I don't know if you received those or not, but um, and I can share them. Um, they did approve <coughs> speech and debate and drama to be in practice on Monday, October 19th. Originally, they, they had pushed that back um, and that they can have uh, competitions after December 1st, but they have to be held virtually. Um, which will be a new and unique challenge. Uh, not really even sure how that's going to work. And then the possibility of having in-person meets will be evaluated later on in the season. Um, for fall sports, uh, cross country, Kalispell is actually the host for state cross country. Um, they broke it up over two days. Uh, class A and B will be on Friday. Class C and class AA will participate on Saturday. Um, there's some things, and I, I sent Mark, uh, well, I called Mark Beckman, the executive director. They're only allowing each participant two tickets uh, to the state meet. And part of the reason for my call is because they upped uh, the number of participants in postseason for volleyball, cross country, or volleyball, soccer, and uh, football. Yeah, seems like cross country would be a sport that you could still physically distance. Well, I think on Rebecca Farms you can spread out <laughs> yeah. if you needed to. So yeah. I have a call in. It, it's a little frustrating. I talked to Mark Dennehy a little bit about it as well, and it does say that you know though they're allowing up to a maximum of six, but then they've also kicked it back to the county health department to determine what number uh, would be allowed, and they're going to allow six uh, passes for a uniform player. Uh, but only two for cheerleaders, and I mean, it just it got. I, I'm not really sure what the the rationale is behind that, but um, I do have a call in about that. Winter sports are being delayed. Uh, basketball, wrestling, and swimming practices uh, aren't starting until December 7th, and the first and normally it would start November 19th, and then the first contest can be held on January 4th. That's to allow for schools and communities to uh, assist in flattening the curve. So, um, yeah, so that's the update from uh, an activity side of things as well. Great to hear about the speech and debate. Yeah. 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 Kelly? Um, even though we seem to spend a lot of time talking about our uh, pandemic efforts and uh, that, I also want to reassure the board that we have a lot of curriculum work that is moving forward. Uh, we are back to our routine meetings with our partner districts in the curriculum co-op uh, model. Uh, we, Mike and I, and the rest of the central office administrators are meeting uh, once a month with our building administrators. Um, we meet K through five, and then we meet um, with the high school, Team, and then the third meeting is we bring them all together. And uh, we have a professional development focus this year for administrators. And so that, that whole piece is going on um, to the best that we can to just make sure that um, we continue with our work in the curriculum assessment and instruction. Uh, we also are in good shape with our traffic ed program. Uh, we have approximately 140 students 
that are waiting right now to get into classes next year. But there is a huge demand in the Valley for traffic ads. Um, and as I mentioned before, what's holding us back is the lack of instructors. The Remote Education Center, we uh, finished our strategic plan meetings today to transition the high schools um, into semester two and transition the elementary and the middle school into trimester two. Uh, we had deliberately held off on that last summer. Um, we just needed to get the rec center open, get the bugs worked out, and then there would be a point in time where we would figure out what that transition needs to look like. We will have students that will leave the rec program and, and take their uh, schooling on campus, and we also are anticipating that we'll have some requests for on-campus students to go to the rec. So we've ironed out um, the process, we've ironed out timelines, uh, they're especially on the high school side, they is quite labor intensive to uh, make, make this transition from semester one and semester two. And then uh, the last thing I would mention that uh, just to reassure the board that there is some, there are some normal things going on and that is our induction mentor program to support our first year teachers. Um, they, we've made modifications and we've been forced to make a few modifications because of the lack of stuff. We would typically have events for everybody and we made modifications but one of the things coming up is that our induction uh, directors are going out and making personal visits to the classrooms of our new teachers and they have um, a, a goodie bag so to speak that they'll give to the teacher and we've got all the administrators on board to support it and the induction directors are not going into the classroom to check um, instructional practices or classroom management or those type of things. They're going in purely to see if they need any support, if they need anything. This is a human thing. It's just taking care of teachers uh, and making sure that we know what they need and that it's being, their needs are being addressed. So uh, we have a lot of things going on in the district that are, it's quality work from a lot of different directions. So I just wanted to reassure the board because sometimes that gets lost in the, all the other things that we have to focus on. But we got a lot of good things. We have all our e grants that have been approved by the state. That's a party in itself. Um, <laughs> I mean, that is, that's a huge undertaking to get those things put in and approved. So, a lot of good people doing a lot of good work for the district. Thank you, Kelly. Thank Seems you. like you have about five uh, work study topics there that we could have talked more about, <laughs> more in depth. <laughs> <laughs> it's only nine. It's only nine. <laughs> My God. We got a confirmation of committee meetings coming up, upcoming meetings? You want to? Yeah. Mike, the, uh, the uh, personnel committee is not on the calendar. The next one on the calendar is November. I know, but the next one <coughs> on the Excuse calendar me. is November 2nd. I mean, not. Uh, November 4th? November 4th. It's just, yeah. But on the actual calendar, school district calendar, it's uh, December 2nd. I will note for the minutes that we need to get that on the calendar on the district website, <laughs> Beth. <laughs> well, we, we need to have some personnel committee meeting. Um, and I think you're going to look and see what fits your calendar best in it so that we can discuss them again as we talk about them. Yep. yep. Thank you, Scott. I can't Scott. hear you. Sorry. Oh, we just need to update the calendar on the personnel committee. Both a I was special kidding. One, I, can hear you. Uh, I can hear you. Calendar. <laughs> Entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Scott. Scott Warnell makes a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Sue, Sue. Sue seconds that. Um, and feel free, uh, remote can remote trustee, to just chime in. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Adjourn. Wait, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.